Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody happy? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I know you're there because there are only seats left. So uh, welcome to the Ultra Capital Markets Day. Um, and thank you all for your continuing interest in Ultra. And uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy days to come and listen uh, to what we have to tell you today. Um, that was uh, a video that we've uh, just actually showed for the first time to the uh, the top 155 or so leaders of Ultra who were actually in this building for the last couple of days when we were formalizing and launching um, One Ultra, the Ultra that we're going to create from what is already a very good set of businesses, but with exceptional opportunities that we very much have the team to deploy. Um, and it sort of describes in quite emotive, certainly for me, gets the heart going. Um, in emotive terms, what we actually do, why we exist, uh, and what we have the ability to do going forward. So this is a slightly unusual capital markets day. I've done a few of these things in my time. And for those of you that got your Excel spreadsheets open and your 97 business line items ready to model, I don't think you're going to be very pleased with today because that's not what we're really here to do. What we're really here to do is to reset everybody's understandings of what Ultra really is. Um, it will coalesce and help you uh, forget about things like picket fence and Doug's shed um, because Doug had an awful lot more in his head when he was putting things in his shed than he might have ever shared with you. What we're going to talk to you about today and what we hope you'll take away is firstly, we've got very much an enhanced team that can take this business forward for the next five to 10 years. 
And that team is enhanced with really capable people from the outside uh, who've come in from exceptional organizations with great careers to enhance the already really good operational folks we have. Um, and I'll introduce you to them in a minute. Um, and we're going to clarify and hopefully level set everybody on the strategy Ultra is going to follow for the foreseeable future. And to help you understand the strategy plan, the strategic plan we have in place uh, to execute that strategy and to give you a hint at what effective execution might look like um, for you guys that really do want to do some modeling um, at some stage in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about our markets. We're in a good place. The majority of our markets are defense related. Our biggest single market is the US defense market. There's good momentum in that market and actually in broader defense markets across the world. Uh, and we see good visibility in those markets, always accepting that they're cyclical. And we also see really good opportunity for us in those growing markets. And you'll hear a bit more about that from Mike and Tom. Um, all of that means we hope you'll take away that this is a growth company. Uh, it has a very strong technology base. Uh, it is technology that is aligned with the needs of our customers and the future needs of our customers. And we are already using that technology to win more than our fair share of the sort of business we should be winning. And those of you that follow us closely will know that we have a very healthy order book. In fact, I think the order book uh, in 2018 was close to its all-time high. Um, and uh, we've had a good 2019, which we'll hopefully share more with you in March of this year. Something that maybe is forgotten a little bit about Ultra, and I do have a bit of sympathy for those that will raise an eyebrow at this, we are a surprisingly resilient business. So although we are principally in the defense and aerospace arena with all its joyous cycles, actually we have very significant visibility because we are on long-term programs that have longevity but we are very well spread across a wide range of programs and we are relatively small suppliers into those programs of very critical kit. That means that actually this business is pretty robust even if there is defense reallocations, if certain types of programs are slowed, although we don't see any of that risk actually today. But I just wanted to uh, hope that you will walk away from here understanding this business is actually pretty resilient. Um, performance, hopefully you will also pick up the message that we all think there's the opportunity for very significant performance improvement in this group. We think we have opportunities to accelerate our top line growth. We think we have opportunities to improve delivery and improve the efficiency with which we provide our services and products to employees. Admittedly, it'll take time, but there is very material opportunity uh, in that space to improve performance. And finally, returns. <coughs> we hope you'll take away. We are very much focused on value creation. So that's cash generation, sustainable returns on invested capital. So whilst the historical this capital allocation discipline of this group may have raised one or two eyebrows. Uh, we hope you take away great comfort that that's ultimately what we really care about in Ultra today. And ideally, you'll understand why I'm here and why I'm so excited about this business. I think Ultra is an extraordinary company that has exceptional opportunities. And uh, to be in an organization like this, at the, at the stage in my career that I'm at, I think is actually a privilege. So those are the key takeaways that we hope you'll take from the next two or three hours. Uh, this is what we're going to cover. Uh, I'm going to drone on for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the team. I'm going to introduce them to you. They'll stand up, just give you a couple of seconds on them. I'm just going to do a very quick reminder of where we were at the beginning of 2019. I'm going to share with you a bit more of the color that that video we saw right at the beginning represents about the vision and the mission and the values that we've set for the organization for the next five to 10 years. And I'm going to give you an update on where we are on some of those initiatives I shared with you um, at the interims uh, in 2019 and at the prelims in March of last year. 
Then I'm going to hand over to Richard Cashin. He's going to introduce himself in a minute. He's going to share with you a few thoughts about the markets in, we're play- in which we're playing, how they're looking, what we see in the medium to long term, and why we think we're well positioned in those markets. And then to the meat of today, um, I'm going to hand over to Tom Link, who is the president of our Maritime Strategic Business Unit, and I'll share with you what that means in a minute. And Tom is going to spend some time helping you understand what we do in the maritime space and what our strategy is for accelerated future growth uh, in that arena. Um, Then we're going to take a bit of a break, uh, get you some coffee, and then um, Mike Baptiste, who is the president of our um, Intelligence and Communications SBU, will stand up and share with you a little bit about what that's all about. The focus of today is not really on all of Ultra. It's on the two main defence businesses in Ultra, our largest SBUs by far. But Richard, will share with you uh, a little bit about our other three specialist detection and control businesses. And then finally, we're going to ask Joss. We're going to be evil because he's only been here seven weeks, Joss? It's my fifth working week. Fifth working week. Um, fifth working week. So Joss is going to give you some first impressions about what uh, he thinks about the place having been here for a bit. And then I'm going to just try and paint a picture, very high level, uh, of the future. We'll try and, try and get the formal presentations finished by five. Um, and then we'll give you a chance. Uh, I think there'll be some drinks somewhere uh, at the back and give you a bit more of a chance to spend time talking to our technical teams who are here just to display some of the really exceptional technology that exists in this group for those of you that haven't already torpedoed a submarine. Um, That's the corner if you want to do that, by the way. Um, Everybody good? Everybody still awake? Okay, so that's the program for today. Right, so we thought, because there's been quite a lot of change over the last year in the team, um, I'll just ask them to stand up and do a sort of two minutes, this is who I am, this is where I was, this is why I'm here. Um, You'll all at this end need to look this way, because they're all in that corner. Um, why don't we start with Joss? Just two seconds, Joss, because you get to speak a bit later. Hi, guys. Um, so this is my <laughs> fifth week here, um, although I, it has been a pretty solid, uh, intense immersion, so I feel I know the business reasonably well, uh, but I don't know it as well as Sandy knows it, so I'm quite glad he's not here. Um, before this, I was CFO of Castrol, which is part of the BP group. Uh, there I was instrumental in leading a big transformation program that helped turn Castrol around from nine quarters of shrinking profits to three quarters of growing profits by the time I left. Uh, And before that, as many of you know, I was at GKN. I was group CFO there through the hostile takeover. Um, During that period, actually, I'm not going to dwell on it too much. It's a bit painful. Um, But I did learn a lot in that period, actually. I learned that any company can probably go faster than it thinks it can. Uh, almost every company has a lot of operational improvement. And actually, I took that into Castrol and found that it did indeed have a lot of operational improvement that we could deliver to it. Uh, And I learned that speed and keeping the pace and driving the culture of change is really, really important. Again, I took that into Castrol, and it's something that I'll be helping Simon with here. Before that, I was head of corporate finance at GKN and played a pretty leading role in the acquisition of uh, well, a number of acquisitions, including Volvo Aero, which has turned out to be a jewel both for GKN shareholders and now for Melrose's shareholders. Um, I, think I'm- I know a good number of you already, um, but unlike Joss, I'm no longer counting weeks, so I've now been here eight months, I think, um, and head up strategy, M&A, corporate development. Um, probably where most of you will know me from is Megit. So I was at Megit for seven and a half years, the first five of which was head of IR, um, where I aspired to do as good a job as Gabby does here. Uh, And then the last two and a half years, I was CFO of one of the divisions. And then prior to that, I was an investor, which some of you know. And before that, I was at Rolls-Royce doing M&A latterly. So that's me. Steve? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Izquierdo. I've been with Ultra for just over one year now. Uh, spent 25 years um, in HR, absolutely love what I do, passionate about developing people and cultures. Uh, spent six years at Cargill, eight years at BP, 10 years at uh, PepsiCo. Uh, so hoping to continue that run with at least 12 plus years here. Um, 
And uh, I guess in my last few roles at PepsiCo, a lot of big transformation roles, helping roll out new HR, uh, new business operating models, setting up change, uh, change management teams to, to manage change better in the organization. I sat on the UK executive team helping to, to run the snacks and the beverage business. Um, uh, so yeah, one year here, uh, a fantastic opportunity. I'm excited at what we can do with the people and the culture. Uh, and um, I'm now handing on to- Thank you, Louise, I think. Uh, and by the way, Steve's definitely got 12, 12 years worth of work here, for sure. Hi, I'm Louise Rupel. I'm General Counsel and Company Secretary. Uh, I've been at Ultra for actually almost, well, it is a year now, this yeah, week. Yeah, week. Um, having a fantastic time, I have to say. Uh, before I was at Ultra, I started life as a solicitor in the city, working at Slaughter in May. I was in their corporate team, having qualified there. Uh, after a very brief uh, year at Merrill Lynch, um, which I really didn't enjoy. I moved in-house to um, a company called First Group, who some of you may know, some of you may not love. Um, it's a FTSE 250 transport company. I was there uh, at a time when they were really growing, uh, really transforming. Um, their business um, expanded in the US hugely. Uh, and there are some similarities with Ultra in that the US has actually ended up as a bigger part of their overall business than the UK, albeit it's a UK listed company. It also has uh, similarities in that it's a contracting business. A uh, large part of their revenue comes from contracts in the US, particularly with government entities. Um, so some similarities, some learning, some things to bring here, some things not to do as well. Uh, after that, I had a couple of years at um, in the airports business. So I worked for Manchester Airports Group, which owns Manchester, East Midlands and Stansted. And then I met Simon and the rest is history. Thanks, Louise. So as you can quite rightly see, the longest serving person that you've heard from so far is me at 18 months. So what the hell do we know about a business that's been around for 30 years? Well, pleasingly, well, the next two gentlemen have here for, been here for slightly longer than we had, than the rest of us. So Tom. I'm, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, you'll tell by my accent. Um, I'm not from the UK. I'm from the US. Uh, I run the maritime business. Um, obviously, I'm from Indiana in the Midwest. I mean, that makes perfect sense, right? Um, I have uh, been with the business for over 20 years, okay? Um, I started my career with Boeing. I'm an engineer, uh, electrical engineer. Um, started in uh, systems engineering, program management. Um, I ended up running the Sonobuy business, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, which has run out of Indiana. Uh, I took the divisional role or the SBU role about 18 months ago. So I've been on the exec team for that period of time, and I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, Tom. And last but not least, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm the longest standing person. Uh, I've been in Holdsworth for 31 years. Um, I joined um, as a junior engineer. Uh, designing crypto for our nuclear deterrent. Very brave thing to let a junior engineer do, but they did. Um, then I moved on, a little bit more defense work, and then I moved into do designing and leading teams in the civil aerospace world within Ultra. Um, I was responsible for the active noise control system that we've developed and, and uh, been successful with. Uh, did that for about 10 years. Um, then I moved back into defense, um, where I was uh, leading uh, teams on Sonoboy development, uh, sonar towed array systems. And then more latterly, I moved into designing leading teams and businesses on the communication side of things. Um, and I guess that's where I am now. So I'm the uh, SBU uh, leader for uh, the, the intelligence and communications business unit, and I'm very proud uh, to do so. Thanks, Thank Mike. So as you can see, um, a team relatively new, but really there to enhance and support the huge operational depth that we have within the organization uh, in Mike and Tom and the teams that work for them. So let's just do a bit of, uh, a bit of um, level setting. Uh, where were we at the beginning of 2009? So sort of in the important things that I think companies should care about and investors in companies should care about. Um, and I've done these in a rag chart, red, amber, green. I would say we were amber on technology. Uh, what did I mean at the beginning of, 19, uh, of 2019 by that? We have areas of very deep, very specialized domain expertise. We have some really, really clever people who know some really, really interesting stuff about some very, very narrow areas of science. 
We also have quite a widespread understanding of lots of other technologies and capabilities that we're not necessarily experts in, but that we use. But our investment in our technology is relatively thinly spread. It's not particularly focused. And historically, we've tended to invest in the person that shouted the loudest. Culture. So I've given that a red. And the culture's red because basically this was an aggregation of 30 or 40 businesses that were run with complete autonomy, almost complete autonomy, with relatively limited or poor collaboration. It was only about 18 months ago that we actually stopped bidding against each other for the same piece of work. Um, there was a lot of internal competition and the business units themselves are very tactical. It sort of didn't feel like being part of Ultra was anything other than a hindrance to a number of these businesses. People, great engineers, really strong engineering talent. I think about half of Ultra's 4,500 employees are degree qualified or above. Most of them, 20% of them, Steve, are actually engineers with uh, engineering degrees. Um, so lots and lots of engineering, engineering talent. Um, much less capable in the functional area, and we were hopeless at developing people. So if you, looked at, if you look at our engineering talent, it sort of looks a bit like me with hair. So mid-50s, sort of, actually looks, doesn't look anything like me because they're really intelligent and I'm not. But um, So an ageing engineering workforce and relatively limited investment in the next wave of engineers who are slightly different and will drive our technology and our capability in a slightly different way than we've historically done, um, and no investment in them. Strategy, Doug Shed, uh, picket fence, flywheels. I never really understood any of that. I think we were electronics hold holding company at best, very short-term revenue focused, very short-term margin focused, and the main measure of success was EPS, which, as you know, is not something that I particularly spend a lot of time looking at. It tends to be an outcome of a whole bunch of other things and is a very short-term measure. Um, and no, no thought really about returns on invested capital uh, or, or, any, or any of the things that I think uh, are a measure of true long-term value creation. Great markets, though. You know, really good tailwinds. US defense spend rising since 2016. MOD stable, even beginning to tick up a bit. Um, our other markets, uh, energy, pretty good. Forensics, pretty good. Aerospace, very good. Um, so good, positive tailwinds. Operations, a bit like culture, very site-based. In fact, all our business units were based on physical sites. There was no, uh, gr no understanding of um, common customer financial outcomes, common program financial outcomes, or anything like that. Um, Okay, operation uh, financial oversight. Um, you know, I don't think there's a control issue here. I think the numbers are right. It's just, is the right information being used to make the right decisions that drive those numbers? Um, this is, we actually have acquired 50 rich, 53 companies since 1996. <laughs> we haven't integrated any of them unless they were going bust. Um, and then we sort of banged a few together into the same physical location. So no really thoughtful approach to integrating the businesses to get the best out of them whilst retaining the strengths of the individual businesses themselves and very underinvested, particularly in IT infrastructure. Um, in fact, we had a, in our conference, we were having a little chat about IT infrastructure. Apparently, we actually had 41, 41 or 43? 44. 44 different IT infrastructures, um, and as you all probably will know, no global address book. And therefore, we didn't have very common processes, we didn't have very sensible systems. And performance was okay, but we did have some delivery issues, which you're aware of, and there was a bit of history of negative surprises. Um, that sounds quite negative, and it's more negative than it really was, because at the most important thing, which is really markets and technology, we've got good technology, really good technology, which we're probably not exploiting well enough, and we've got great markets in which to exploit it. So I would say this is a good set of businesses that needed focus, it needed fixing, and we've started 
that journey. During the course of 2019, we've been pretty much defining what we do and how we create value. So you will have heard in the past about 100 gazillion capabilities and segments and blah de blah So we've taken all the subjective and intuitive views away, and we've looked at what we actually do and how we actually create value. We've looked at the opportunity to create parenting advantage between all the businesses, and we've reviewed and aligned the portfolio and focused on those where we think there's the greatest opportunity for value creation, either inherently within the business themselves or for operating them in a slightly different way under a more joined up ultra. In order to start to drive the cultural change, we've created a vision for One Ultra, of which the video you saw is a pictorial representation. We've built a strategy around how to go after that value creation, and we've designed an organization to support the best execution of that strategy and to drive delivery of what we think is an exciting story. Most importantly, we've been building a roadmap on how to deliver Ultra's potential. We're not trying to boil the ocean. And the reason we're not trying to boil the ocean is firstly, this organization is not in crisis. It has a fantastic order book. It's focused on good local delivery. And therefore we have decided to phase how we transform Ultra because we have the largest order book ever to deliver. So in phase one, and phase one is a couple of years, we are focusing on culture and talent, getting the right culture in the place and getting the right people uh, in place to succeed and enhancing the functional capability that is really important to a business full of really good engineers. We're designing an operating model that's fit for purpose, that supports strategic execution, and we are inv investing more in research and development, internal research and in development to enhance and further expand our technology place, but in the places where we can win. We're absolutely driving operational improvement. So we're focusing on designing and implementing some common and improved high-level standard processes and the more efficient deployment of our people and resources, as well as defining and designing a back office that's efficient and effective um, and that delivers what the businesses need to have delivered without disrupting what they do, but in the most cost-effective and efficient way. And then finally, the infrastructure. In order to do all this, we've got to invest more in supporting technical and other collaboration, and that means better IT systems. Uh, if actually it means one IT infrastructure, it means better IT systems and improved effective management information that allows us to make more effective, speedier, and better decisions. The key message is, We've been doing a lot of this stuff in parallel to all the strategic planning and execution. We're making really good progress, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And we're increasing the pace at which we invest and change now that the cultural, uh, the cultural organization is beginning to recognize where it's going to go. So, strategy. What are we doing with Ultra? Well, we're tur turning it from an aggregation of 50 plus independent business to businesses into a, create a <coughs> into a cohesive solutions provider. What we do, we're a trusted partner in key elements of mission critical and intelligent systems. So some people have heard of the OODA loop. We've decided to call it the five Ds. We, we are in some or all of in intelligent systems Detecting, distilling what's been detected, directing what's been detected and distilled, and then deploying using what we've directed to make something happen. That's what we do throughout Ultra. What we specialize in, we're problem solvers. We're applications engineers. We don't spot market niches and design a product to suit that market. We understand and get close to our customers. We recognize the problems and help them understand the problems they face today and they're going to face in the future. And we help them solve those problems. Sometimes that leads to us designing and building product for them. But at our core, we are applications engineers. We are really cool at signature and data capture and processing. 
So we don't make sensors. What we're really good at is at designing sensors that sense really tough stuff in really difficult places, gather that and process it, turn it into data, turn it into something that somebody can do with it. We're also really cool at taking all that data and sending it somewhere, usually in an encrypted or a secure way, often in a hostile environment. We're also really cool at turning all of that funky data that we gathered into information. So understanding what that data is telling us, creating analytics and interpreting it, and then doing something with it, allowing an operator or a system or a machine to react to what we've told it in an effective way. And then we've got some little specializations on the side. We're really cool at, at specialist encryption, secret stuff. We do a lot of subsystems integration. So we're not a tier two. We're not going to be a tier two. We will occasionally be a tier two supplier when we own the majority of the system. But it does mean we're quite good at integrating subsystems in and around what we deliver to the customers. <clears throat> we're good at size, weight, and power. That's what SWAP means in harsh and often regulated environments. So we're really good at designing stuff that gets fired, it gets neutrons fired at it, it goes to extraordinary temperatures, it is under extraordinary pressure. Um, and then finally, we're quite good at signature and power management. And all of this is really important in our ability to play in those mission critical and intelligent systems. Where we operate, we are very much focused on Five Eyes defense. So uh, UK, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, why? They tend to be the people with the biggest budgets and they tend to be the most technically sophisticated of the customers we can access that want the sorts of things that we can provide to them. We will supply into other defense markets where we've created broadly modular solutions satisfying the 5i demand. So we're quite happy to tweak things that we have made to sell into non 5 eyes nations. And equally, we're quite happy to sit behind our primes and our Five Eyes customers as they sell platforms uh, outside of their domestic market. And we're also quite happy operating in highly selected, highly regulated and harsh environment complicated markets where we're doing that detecting, distilling, directing and deploying. So if you get a chance at the back, Serge and Fernando will share with you a little bit about what they do in our ballistics business, which when you sit back and Look at it, well, what's, got, what's bullets got to do, or understanding and matching bullets to cartridges got to do with sensing a Russian, Russian submarine 300 miles away, moving at three knots. I think you'll, if you start to talk to them, you'll hear it's all about data, data capture, data analytics, and that's what they do too. And then finally, how do we enhance value? Well, basically, if you're in Ultra, you're a business that we're going to be able to accelerate growth in, we're going to break, uh, be able to drive operational efficiency in, and we're going to create value discipline around. So that's what Ultra strategy is going forward. And every business in Ultra that we invest in will tick those boxes going forward. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time uh, on this bit, but this is the outcome of our vision, mission, values work. Uh, this has been shared with the organization as of Tuesday. Um, it has been pulled together in a very collaborative way. We've gone to all our external stakeholders. We've gone to our little of internal people to come up with the why we exist, our vision, our mission, and our values. Why is this stuff important for you as investors? This actually sets the cultural tone in the organization. This is the sort of roadmap. These are the, um, uh, these are the sort of swim lanes that the organization is going to operate to. Um, and it's the first time anything like this has really existed in Ultra. And I think it fell on pretty receptive ears over the last couple of days. I mean, it, uh, you guys all sort of looked at that video and I'm sure thought, well, that's quite cool and nice and fun. I have to say there were people in our audience uh, over the last uh, couple of days who were crying when they saw that because it finally gives them something that they've always understood they worked in where they saw huge potential for this is really release, creates a framework and an environment where we, where we can release their potential. And 
Just a little bit about mission and what it means to us. And, you know, not this is not a nod to the ESG agenda. This is very real for us. What we've done is design an organization with a vision and a mission and a set of values that delivers exceptional value for all our stakeholders, not just you guys. I know you really want it all to be about you, but unfortunately it's not. There is an equal weighting place within Ultra going forward on delivering exceptional value for our employees, for our customers, for our suppliers, from our communities, and of course, for our shareholders. And we've actually defined what we're trying to produce. And although I'm not going to share them to you with you today, there are specific 2020 and 2024 goals against each of these measures which allow all our organization to understand if you're a stakeholder in Ultra, what does good value look like to you? And we will measure our performance against those key performance indicators to determine whether or not we are delivering the exceptional value for all stakeholders we know we can deliver. And the organization's resourcing and, uh, and investment strategies will all be driven by achieving the goals that sit behind what we've defined as great value for our stakeholders. And there's a, a bit of goodness on top. So there's plenty of parenting advantages that we can drive in this group that have not been sought before. This is a bit generic, this side, but frankly, we remain an aggregation of 53 relatively unintegrated businesses. So the sorts of values, that the value that we think we can generate over and above what I've just touched on is all around people. So investing and developing and moving and deploying our best people in the best place at the right time to maximize the value creation that we see. An ability with focus to enhance the speed and pace of innovation. And this is an organization that lives on innovation and our customers require us to increasingly innovate on our own risk. Strategic relationships. In our conference yesterday, we were talking about how we're gonna communicate with our customers and it turns out that I think we have 17 different people in the room that they think they have a unique relationship with the Ministry of Defense. That clearly isn't true, it's very tactical. There is a massive opportunity to get to create strategic rather than tactical engagement with all of our customers so that we start to cross sell all of Ultra's capabilities at the right point in solutions development, not after we've won a small piece of work. Technology sharing, we make Sona Boys in four, four, three or four, three different locations in the world. Tom will tell you, having spent all his life in Sona Boys, they are really, really, really complicated. He's right, they are, but they don't need to be three different ways of making them. Um, similarly, I could go through Sonar, I could go through, so there's lots and lots of things where we have great core technology but we've often, we're often using different technology to solve the same problems, which we've probably reinvented three or four different times. So technology sharing is a big opportunity for us and clearly capital discipline. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, but you'll understand that capital allocation and, is a key piece of uh, the work Joss has done and will continue to do uh, going forward. And we're not very efficient. So we have an ability to create better utilization from all of our core capabilities. Um, I think for an organization that turns over around 800 million, employs about four and a half thousand people, we have somewhere between 50 something and 80 something sites. If you do the maths, we have a hell of a lot of floor, very small floor space. And despite what the engineers will tell you, there's massive opportunity from bumping into people in the kitchens and it has a significant impact on reducing your ESG and your environmental impact if you have people in the same place doing the same work. We need to improve our functional operating models. We're sort of a little bit behind in where people have evolved to. So Joss and Steve have been doing a lot of work on looking at creating efficiency within our finance function, our HR function, and other areas that we can pursue in that regard. And scale benefits. So combining the group's procurement power. We have 63 people who supply us with PCBs. 
We actually have 63 people that supply us with PCBs and five places where we do it ourselves. So again, the opportunity for greater collaboration and using our scale is significant. We've got to improve some of our processes. We have pretty good processes for small, for, for small single business units, but there are much more efficient ways we can do some of the bigger stuff across the group. And of course, sharing best practice, um, where we do have some exceptional areas of process and capability excellence. It's just, it takes quite a long time to find it and even longer to work out who you need to speak to, to sort it out. So lots and lots and lots of opportunity for a business that's fundamentally good and sound and has great technology. So from 2021, and I'll explain why it's from 2021 in a minute, we're gonna reorganize. And those of you that have been following Ultra for a bit will go, oh my God, not another restructuring. So uh, I think um, Richard Webb, our controller, Rich, sorry, Richard, at the back. Uh, what we're gonna try and do is cut the financials at the prelims in this way, as well as the traditional reporting way. So you can see how the numbers will stack up under this, this new organizational structure. Organizational structure. Um, and what you see is five strategic business units. So these are, um, this is Maritime, Tom's division. This is Intelligence and Comms, that's Mike's division. Um, and then our aerospace and land business, PCS, Forensic te Technology and Energy. These are our strategic business units. What does it mean? The management teams in those yellow boxes are responsible for setting strategy within the broad group strategic framework for overseeing execution of that strategy and driving operational efficiency and operational delivery within their divisions. Um, Tom will talk to you a little bit about his structure and Mike will talk to you a little bit about his structure, but basically each of them will have four operating business units underneath them. Those are the business units tasked with operational delivery and they are designed around common capabilities, common customers and common applications. Uh, this is a way of not making Sona boys in three different places if you only need to make them in two. This is a way of stopping designing four different Sona solutions to the same problem. This should enhance strategic execution. It should engage much greater clarity amongst our customers. Uh, and this is all about driving strategic value creation for our stakeholders. This is the right organization organization designed to do it with. And then just lastly from me, and I'm Gabby's gonna start throwing things at me in a minute because I'm running a bit over time. Where are we on some of the initiatives you know about uh, and heard about at the prelims? So vision, mission, values, cultural transformation, all started. So you've seen the VMV, the cultural transformation. Steve's done an awful lot of work around aligning people, development and reward to those values over the last year, and that's being rolled out right now. And we've also uh, defined, decided, engaged, and are now rolling out um, a standard cross-group HRIS system that is not called Excel. So for the first time, we actually have, and will have um, by the end of next year, a tool by which we can engage and support and manage and develop our people. Operating model, you've seen the outcome of the org design work. That wasn't something that Simon came up on, uh, came up with on the back of a fag packet. That's a year's worth of what are we good at? How do we create value? Where do we need to make decisions? Where do we need to put decisions to make sure the right people are empowered to make the right decisions at the right time? That work's nearly finished. It's certainly finished at the group level. Mike and Tom have got a little bit more tweaking to do um, to get it finalized at their level, but it's ready, it will be ready to launch in 2021. Um, included in all of that is defining what everybody gets to do in this new brave new world we have. And we're also in the process now of matching our people and their capabilities to the roles that we want them to have in 2021. And there are gonna be some gaps so we are also looking at enhancing and building on our talent pipeline. And we've definitively set the organization's objectives and goals for the next five years. We have started and have actually delivered a couple of processes 
that are now standard across the group, the most recent of which is our, uh, our approach and our process around program and project management. And we have become much more risk focused and much more effective in the commercial area of our business, which frankly is something where there is lots and lots of opportunity, but because we're in long-term contracting, only something that you can uh, optimize as you sign up to new contracts. And then finally, uh, I don't want to, tell it, to give you a sneak preview of what's going to, what we're going to talk to you about in March, but we have picked up our internal research and development spending in the key things that are important to us, like Sona Boys. Um, probably not as much as you might think, only because we've also applied a very valued-based discipline approach to looking at where we invest. And some of the projects that came forward at the beginning of 2019 did not pass the value test but much better discipline in IR and D, much better oversight. And then finally, IT and infrastructure. We now have a chief information officer. We have got one IT infrastructure. We're in the middle of rolling it out. We've got a lot of work to do in 2020 around our management inf information systems and our IT and our data infrastructure to allow us to run the business in 2021 in the way that we're showing. Um, but that works uh, in hand and, and on its way. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on around standard applications that run on our IT infrastructure. So I'd say good progress. This stuff isn't free. We are taking some costs. We're taking them in the business. We'll tell you what they are as we take them. But you'll be pleased to know that all of these have got very good paybacks. And therefore, we're quite comfortable with where the market is for 2019 and we'll tell you what we think we're going to do in 2020 when we speak when we speak to you in march <clears throat> and last but not least you know is this sort of a bit of simon fantasy is this a bit mm, well it's all very well but this is the proof as to why what ultra is trying to do is the right thing to do I think most of you know about these. These are all big contracts that we've announced in the last year or so. What I just want to highlight is not the contracts themselves, it's actually why we won them. So CSE, this is the Canadian Surface Combatant. This is 15, up to 15 frigates, Tom, is it? Something like that. Um, we're providing a chunk of the sonar stuff on these frigates. How did we do it? We actually did it by sharing our sonar technology across all the countries in which we operate. That's how we won this program. Radar systems. This is something where we've invested in the past in develop. I didn't even know we did radars when I first joined. In investing in some of the signal management transmissions associated with surface radar. We have now won um, NGSSR, which I think you guys have heard of, Next Generation Surface Search Radar. Search radar. Uh, and that has led on to further opportunity to develop surface radar for submarines. And we've got some hardware and some, tech to some software technology award in there as a, as a result of us investing in the right bits of those intelligent systems <laughs> and then using that capability to, to apply to other intelligence systems. Similarly, the Mark 54 torpedo, um, great technology investment which we've made, which has allowed us to win that business. And then finally, Orion, the Orion radio, which is the, um, the radio that you've heard a lot about. This is the, uh, the radio that the US military has acquired. It took us seven years to develop this. But this is now as a result of significant innovation, not only in execution phase and very material, but leading to huge other opportunities in lots of other radio areas. This gives us that we're doing the right thing, we're moving in the right direction, and the organization is, res is responding to the changes we're trying to drive. That's it from me. I'm not going to offer the opportunity to ask questions right now. Rich is going to come up and talk about markets. Then we're going to hear from uh, Tom on Maritime, and then there'll be a chance to quiz Tom on Maritime. Then we'll have a bit of a break. Um, but there will be an opportunity for questions of me and everybody at the end, so keep scribbling uh, anything that you want to know the answers to, and there'll be plenty of time to raise it. With that, Rich, over to you, Markets. Thank you.
Thanks, Simon. What do you think of the video? Awesome, wasn't it? Best bit about today. Um, so the markets. Uh, thank you, Simon. I'm just, I just want to give you a, an overview of the markets that we play in and why we think that um, they're great markets for Ultra. Um, so starting with uh, the maritime defence market, and you, you see I've put a, a, a 2018 market potential number on there of 5.1 billion. That's a big number. So there's a huge amount for us to go at. Uh, when Tom comes up here later on and talks through his individual maritime strategies, he will um, put up a number of addressable subcategories, as it were. Uh, those don't add up to 5.1 billion. They add, add up to a number that's smaller than 5.1 billion. And the difference really is that kind of we're moving one step ahead in the in the delivery of the strategic plan. So for uh, for example, Simon talked about radar. He didn't know we did radar. Um, most of us didn't know we did radar, uh, but we've won a couple of really interesting things in radar, and we actually have a tremendous amount of capability. So the way we define our addressable market is absolutely constrained by what we have already won. And so Tom will come up with an addressable market in navigation and surface search radar of 61 million pounds, I think it is, give or take. The radar market is billions like billions, I think it's at least one and a half billion. Not all of that is addressable to us because we don't have capability for all of it, but we can address a big chunk of it, even with the capability we have today. So that gets included into a number that looks a bit bigger than the addition of Tom's subsegments. Looking at all of the individual pieces within maritime, underwater expendables, so that's things that, things that you chuck in the sea, basically, um, sonar systems, signature, signature and power management, and radar, all of those subcategories are growing quite nicely. And a lot of that growth is driven by uh, a changing threat environment. And so we'll go on to think about that changing threat, of, threat environment in due course. But the underlying message is maritime, great place to be. We've got some phenomenal capabilities. They were just spread all over the place. And Simon's talked about how we're trying to bring those together. If we can start to present ourselves as a cohesive solutions provider to our customers, we stand a far greater chance of winning some market share in this space. C4 I star EW, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to call it C4 from now on, um, because that's just really hard to say. Uh, again, 2018, potential market, 3.1 billion. Again, Mike is going to come up and detail the subcategories of markets that we have addressed up until now, and he will present a number that's smaller than 3.1 billion, but for all the same reasons. However, um, just to put that 3.1 billion in context, the global C4 market in, in 2018 was 93 billion. So huge. And what that tells you is a couple of things. Number one, we don't play globally. We focus very much on the five eyes. Uh, and number two, uh, what we have is quite narrow, but very deep in terms of capability. And so a good opportunity in C4 is to understand how we start filling in the gaps between those narrow strands. Uh, but nevertheless, very exciting. And then finally, um, the, the other specialist critical detection and control businesses uh, specifically commercial aerospace, so that's the PCS business. They also do military aerospace, they do warfighter protection. <clears throat> Nuclear, the energy business, and ballistics identification. I didn't see the value in putting up a market size here because it's actually a number of, it's an aggregation of a number of different markets. And so a big market size number is going to be pretty meaningless. But actually the other reason why I didn't really want to put something up is as we've worked through this strategy process in 2019, we focused very much on the defense businesses and specifically on maritime intelligence and comms. Uh, and so therefore the growth strategies that sit behind these other three businesses are a little bit less mature at the moment. Uh, the good news for the people who sit in those businesses is that we're going to help a bit more this year. So we will be digging into their strategic delivery plans uh, in a huge amount of detail in the first half of 2020, and we'll build up a far better picture of where we think our capabilities lie and where we can confer parenting advantage to those businesses going forward. Um, so a bit of a messy slide, but there are a few takeaways here. Um, the first one, which will come as no surprise to you, is that in the context of global defense spend, uh, the US is pretty significant. And that top donut, on the left-hand side shows that we are pretty well represented in the US defense market. So 60% of our 2018 defense revenues came from the US. But despite that, we, we still remain pretty underrepresented in certain areas, and particularly, interestingly, in maritime. So you know, really, really strong in underwater expendables, perhaps less strong in sonar. Uh, and so there are great opportunities for us to build that, that US presence further. Um, we have a tremendously resilient revenue base. And Simon touched on this, but you know, a couple of couple of numbers that we can pick out. So our top 10 contracts in 2018 were less than 12% of the group revenue. Um, after that, there's like this massive, massive tail. 
So we, we actually, uh, uh, there's, there's a different set of numbers underneath. We talk about the number of platforms. So top 10 platforms, 18%. So that says that we've got numbers of packages of work on the same platform sometimes, but actually a very, very broad spread of business. So we're, we're pretty happy about that spread of business right now. Uh, and then um, the other thing that I really wanted to pick out was the underlying health of the market. And this is what gives us a little bit of confidence in our near-term performance. Um, the, the shaded gray area on the top, represents US military budgets. And typically our revenue tends to lag US budget outlays by about 18 to 24 months. So I've tried to be helpful and I've put a little yellow line on the chart, which effectively moves that budget outlay forward by two years to give you an idea of what our proxy trading environment might look like. And I've even made it a little bit bigger in the bottom right so you can see it. And what it tells you is that that yellow line suggests that we've actually got a pretty healthy tailwind right now, um, which is a great time to start a change program like the one Simon's talking about. So we're actually in a really buoyant market. We've got a great order that we've got to go and deliver. And we've got some really exciting things that we can look forward to, to project a better image of our business to our customer base. So largest global defense market in the world, we're well placed and it's growing. And then the last slide from me for a while um, is this one where I try and distill down everything I've said already into what um, near and medium term growth rates for those markets might look like. Uh, starting in the top two thirds, the maritime market, we think, as we've currently defined it, um, is going to grow at three to five percent. We've done quite a lot of work. That's not numbers we've just plucked out of thin air. Um, and C4I, C4I star EW, it, four to six percent compound over the next five years. Um, what's driving that? So, very much a changing threat environment. Uh, there is no doubt that in all things defense, the US and other Five Eyes markets have have kind of led the, led the world from a technology perspective, and they still do. However, if spend patterns outside of those Five Eyes nations continue the way they're going, there is every chance that that could change, which means that those nations need to adopt a slightly different approach. And it's no longer just buying the biggest, the loudest, the fastest thing. It's going to become far more focused on data and signal processing it's going to become information advantage. So how do you create an advantage where you no longer necessarily have the biggest bang for your buck? Bearing in mind that a dollar spent in the US on defense does not equal a dollar spent somewhere else on defense where you might get rather more for your dollar. Um, so all of this sort of stuff is gonna change. I mean, we're in danger of seeing some technology leapfrogging happening, which we've never seen before, where other nations come up with a, a really quite smart idea, the US now has to respond, and indeed other Five Eyes markets. Um, instead of spending billions and billions on designing the next big new platform, how about spending the same amount on upgrading what you've already got to make it more effective in a, an agile command and control environment, or to make it more effective in contested or denied domains? All of these things are, are what's driving particularly C4, but equally uh, relevant to maritime. Very exciting. Complex simulation is probably going to have more value than having the biggest or the fastest platform. But the combination of the two is going to be unbeatable. So I think we're going to see a bit of a change in, in the way money is allocated over the next few years. And actually, that's driving a bit of a change in the way contracting is done. So more and more in innovation is now being pushed down into industry, which is great, because what it's doing is it's driving a demand for applications engineering solutions, which are then backed up in many cases by commercial off-the-shelf products. That's a bit of a different approach. And we're also seeing far more teaming so that the warfighter can have the best possible information advantage at any one point. So all of this gives us huge amounts of confidence in the near term in A, our markets, and B, our business. And then just finally on the bottom third, um, our other specialist critical detection and control businesses, we think aggregate to about 2 to 4% compound growth rate over the next five years. Um, quite healthy in and of itself and underpinned so we have confidence in that just based on platform positions we've already won. So 787, really good. F-35, really good. Critical life extensions for nuclear power facilities, good stuff. And then finally, a relentless and global increase in gun crime, which is where our ballistics business really shines. Uh, and so that's it from me for now. Tom, I shall hand over to you. Good afternoon again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about maritime strategy. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to just drive home a couple key points of why I'm excited. I can tell you, uh, I've been here for over 20 years and I'm more excited about this business than I ever have been in my career, okay? We're sort of all coming off a little bit of an energy buzz. We spent two days with 150 people 
Um, and I can tell you that the, the energy, the passion um, is, is high right now within Ultra. So the challenge for, the, for this executive team and for all of us is to keep that going and keep us going in the right direction. So there's three reasons I'm excited. Um, for me, number one, it is about the team. It's about the people. Okay. For me, it's always about having the best people in the right seats um, in the most important roles. And I think, you know, if you go all the way from the executive team, if you go into the strategic business units and down into the organization, we have great people. We're bringing in more diverse thinking. Um, and it's, it's uh, definitely moving in the right direction with the people. Um, within the maritime division, we've added some key roles. We've added uh, Dr. Fred Kateris, who's in the back, um, to focus on innovation. Fred comes to us from... Um, uh, with a, with a PhD from ARLUT in acoustics, which is our core, okay? Uh, we've added additional uh, HR resource in the division. So, you know, innovation and people, okay? Um, second thing that excites me about where we are today is, is just the strategy. Um, I think where Ultra has had problems in the past, we've had 19 business units. Um, we haven't done strategy, to, strategy at the right level. So it's important and the, and the big change we've made as we run into 2019 is doing strategy at the, at the SBU level, okay? And, the, and, and Simon stole a little bit of my thunder talking about the Sanbui example, but we had uh, individual business units producing strategies that were in conflict with each other. So, um, two, uh, three businesses producing Sanbuis and, and strategies to compete against each other, okay? So getting the strategy right at the right level is, is important and we're focused on long-term value creation. Okay, so that's what I'll talk about. The, th the third element that I'm excited about is the foundation of the business, and again, Simon hit on this a little bit, but in 2019, we've had some major wins. Um, Canadian surface combatants, Simon mentioned, um, U.S. Sonobuies, we're, we're um, on the U.S. Sonobuie program as a five-year IDIQs, um, uh, which is um, over, uh, Contract value over a billion dollars, okay. Um, torpedo nose arrays, um, Mark 54 lightweight torpedo, and the radar pro propositions. So um, we have a strong foundation for the future, and um, we're, in, we're in good shape. So what I'd like to uh, kick off with is, in the maritime, is the, the uh, core capabilities. Um, you can see up here that we are experts in maritime mission systems, application engineering and solutions, um, sonar radar expendables. This is what we're good at. I do like to um, focus on the, the term uh, mission. We like to keep in, in mind and in, in the forefront of everything we're doing um, what, the, what the end user needs. And um, so that's important. Um, you can see that we're good at transducers. Um, sensors, data, data capture, telemetry, and processing, um, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> revenue by category, you can see uh, where we do our business. Um, we typically do lots of business with the DOD, the MOD, uh, et cetera. You can see the country spread. We're doing a lot of our uh, work in maritime in North America, and we'll continue to grow that. And this is the first... Um, the first view that you can see of our strategic offerings. So what we're gonna talk about in strategy, underwater expendables, uh, sensors and uh, sonar sensors and systems, and signature management. So clear strategic focus, what are our themes? Um, what we wanna focus on is the Five Eyes Nations. And, and again, Simon picked on this a little bit. Um, it's, it's taking what we're good at, um, delivering this to, um, the, uh, okay, focusing on the Five Eyes Nations, leveraging the, the things that we're good at um, into those nations. They're, those customers are good payers. Um, the, the risk is typically tends to be lower. Uh, but what we, we do want to do when we develop those products and sell them to those nations, uh, we want to be able to um, leverage that into customers around the world. Um, second strategic theme. U.S. market, it's the biggest market in the world. Obviously, we want to grow that, that position. Um, the third theme, 
organizing and developing our resources and our teams um, to deliver these objectives, um, increasing uh, the focus on af aftermarket. We do a good job within Ultra uh, and have done a good job within Ultra of um, developing great products, great technology. We need to be a little bit better at pay paying attention to <clears throat> the aftermarket support. Um, and then finally, additional investment to um, accelerate our strategic ob objectives. Uh, in my division, we have uh, doubled the amount of investment from 18 to 19, and uh, we want to keep uh, that investment growing. Okay, so what we're going to talk about in the next series of slides is each of the individual um, offerings. I will first talk about underwater expendables, uh, and underwater expendables. You'll see uh, on the left what the core propositions are, key customers. On the second slide, and it'll be a, a two-slide series, you'll see a bit about each market. So a core proposition for us is uh, sauna buoys. We've, we've talked about it a lot. Uh, it's important to our future within Ultra. Another thing we do in this market space is countermeasures. Uh, countermeasures are similar to sauna buoys in that um, you throw them in the, in the water, they last for a short amount of time, they do their job, and then, um, and then they go to the bottom. Okay. Another bit within this space is the things that support things like sauna buoys uh, and sauna buoy related systems. So we also have um, the, the uh, receivers that go into the aircraft that the sauna buoys communicate with. Okay. The, the important thing about this product area is um, the low cost nature of the product since it's expendable. All of the engineering that goes into these products is geared around um, delivering that low cost product. So it's, it's, uh, it's a design philosophy. This is a representation of the market positions. Um, Significant market here, and we have a strong share. Um, the U.S. market right now is migrating towards a, a more competitive space, um, and we're developing our strategies uh, to support that. Um, in the U.S., we support uh, sauna buoy development through a joint venture, and we'll continue to do that for the next five years. Okay. Um, and beyond that, post that point, uh, investing for um, independent, independent sauna buoy production. So there is significant opportunity here as we transition from um, building sauna buoys in the U.S. under the joint venture, you know, into the future. Okay, so that was the expendables. In the sonar sensors and systems world, um, this is a space where we do things that have to last a long time, so high reliability is important. Um, so what you kind of see on the chart here, it's a little bit hard to see in the upper picture there, but that's a whole mounted sonar. Um, whole mounted sonars are characterized by, um, they have to last a long time, high reliability, um, and they have to be dependable. So this segment is certainly more focused on those kinds of characteristics, and we have, uh, we have great opportunities in the space. Uh, we do whole mounted sonars, we do the kinds of things that you tow behind ships, um, so, so towed sonars, uh, torpedo defense, and then the third category down below um, we call persistence, persistent sonar. Those are systems that are not necessarily on a ship or a submarine, uh, maybe on the, the seafloor. Okay. Um, so we have significant capability here and significant opportunity. Today I'd say we have a niche position here. Um, this is characterized, you can kind of see the, the graphic here, all the different kinds of things we do. Um, which is significant. Um, we have great capability outside the U.S. Uh, we typically sell systems outside the U.S., whereas um, in the U.S. we tend to sell the individual transducer components. Um, so the opportunity here is to take some of the great stuff that we do around the world and bring it into the U.S. market. The third area of strategy um, is around signature management signature management and power systems. Uh, these are the kind of systems that um, manage the emissions out of something like a ship or submarine, okay? So um, 
All of these uh, sorts of vessels are constantly uh, under surveillance and people want to exploit those, um, those vessels. So what we do in this space is we actually manage what comes out either acoustically or sometimes electromagnetically out of these vessels. Okay? We do this kind of work both in the US and the UK. Uh, we have two different businesses today that do that. And we want to put all of this um, technology under, under one management team and under one strategy. Uh, we also do some, some power management, so the, the kinds of high voltage systems that sit on, again, uh, submarines and different kinds of platforms. And we do some specialty motors, high energy density motors. Pretty niche capabilities here, uh, but we think there's good opportunity moving forward. Um, as the world becomes a little bit more dangerous place, and we have, we have nations around the world that some of our threat uh, and ad adversary nations around the world picking up the pace of their submarine activity, it's important that we keep our systems safe. And that's really what this, this segment is about. Okay? Uh, you can see the market size there. Again, as Rich said, this is thinking about the market in terms of what we do today and the capabilities that we bring. Um, as we expand our capabilities, um, we'll think about you know, the market in a bigger way. And it gets more along the lines to what Rich was talking about. And then the fourth area of focus for us from a strategy standpoint is radar systems. Uh, again, Simon mentioned this at the beginning. Um, when I got into this role and was um, you know, speaking to all the businesses around the division, of which when I started there was eight individual SBUs, or I'm sorry, uh, business units. Um, several of our business units did not even know we did radar. So significantly in 2019, we won two major US programs around radar. Um, we did um, threw up this large acronym NGSSR, so if, uh, but, but Simon uh, described it, it's the next generation surface search radar. So this is the radar that goes on a ship and allows the ship to have visibility of um, other vessels in the near, the near um, vicinity. So think about in harbors and shipping lanes, it's really important to have this sort of, sort of radar. There was a specific need that generated um, this program in the US where there was some difficulty with some of the platforms. So this program has been accelerated. We took some technology from um, a business that we had acquired about five years ago, which was a small business in the US at the time, and we've leveraged that into this program. So we have um, you know, a significant hardware development program underway right now with long-term production capability. Right now, the plan is for every US Navy ship to have this, this radar on it. Okay, so that's significant. Um, in addition to that, really, Sort of the secret sauce in this is the software that we bring, okay? It's, it's the ability to detect the uh, periscopes or small objects um, in a very cluttered environment. And um, so there's both a hardware and software component to it. The bit we're working on in submarines is a software component, okay? So what, is, what does this market look like? Rich, again, Rich talked about it. $61 million is how we're characterizing the market today. The, if you really look at the radar market, it's probably uh, $1.4 billion. But that includes you know, the big radars um, that you know, currently we don't have the capability uh, to compete in. Uh, but, but really the exciting part about this is um, as, as we execute this program and we get on the platforms, we start delivering the software, we get, we get the uh, support contracts that go along with that, we can start expanding the opportunity into adjacencies. And actually, there, there's a significant opportunity here to grow market share okay, beyond what's on this chart. That's one of the reasons why we put this um, as one of our, our four major um, strategy offerings. Okay? So significant potential. Okay. Um, so to summarize all that, we have four elements of strategy in the maritime space, underwater expendables, sonar, signature management, radar. Um, what you see here is the, really the top level um, objectives. Um, one of the exciting things about what we're doing, again, as we move forward, is we're making sure that strategy is not something that just sits on a shelf. It's actually a plan. Um, 
All the, the objectives here, while written fairly generally, we're certainly internally uh, developing specific objectives around all of these things. We'll manage that over time uh, to ensure that you know, we can deliver these outcomes. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an exciting space to be in. Hey, all right. Tom, I'm conscious that there's sort of a lot of information on those slides and a lot of, sort of funky pictures that nobody really quite understands. Well, I definitely don't. Um, but this is a good opportunity to either ask to clarify some of that stuff or ask any questions of Tom and particularly about his maritime businesses and his maritime strategy. Hopefully you can see a very consistent theme in there um, back to what sort of we flagged as the group strategy. This is all about detect, distill, distribute. Um, these are maritime multi-mission systems, which Tom can really do really for any mission, virtually any yep. mission above or below water. Um, we've just never thought about it like that before. So any questions? I think we have a mic. So if you just, uh, if you could just say who you are and then what your question is, we'll, we'll pick that up. Hi, it's uh, Richard Page from Numis. Um, just a couple of questions, please. First of all, on the Sonoboy market, yep. um, moving to independent production, obviously pushed through by the DOD. Could you just elaborate a bit more about what that entails for Ultra and how long that might take, um, please? Um, and then, sorry, I suddenly became very loud there. <laughs> um, and then on the, uh, just looking at across your business opportunity as a sort of cohesive ultra one opportunity. Where, where would you say within the business is your biggest opportunity or what, what yeah. which area of the market does that go to? So I've just thought of a third as well. On the aftermarket side, sorry to dominate, but uh, on the aftermarket side, could you just elaborate a bit more on what that entails, um, the opportunities in that part right. as well? Thank you. So I want to make sure I get, get those all right. So the first bit was about the US Sonobly market moving to a more competitive environment. So I think, you know, clearly out in, in the public domain, there's been um, some discussion around uh, and some published information around what was happening with Arapsco. Okay, so there's an intent within the US Navy to move to a more competitive environment. Now, the, the, the good part about that is um, the Navy recognizes, that the US government recognizes that delivery of sonobuoys is critical. So there was no intent to disrupt, you know, immediately disrupt the, the, the current supply. So right now we do have five-year contracts, 19 through 23, to deliver the current buoy sets under the joint venture. Okay, and those contracts have been awarded, and I think you probably are aware of those. Um, in the in the time between, you know, 19 and, and we get into 2024, you know. Every business that's interested in this market has to come up with their independent strategies, do their RRI business cases to decide, you know, do we want to play in this space or not? Clearly, since we've been in this space for a long time, it's been good for Ulta. Ultra, we're very interested in that. And so we're making those strategic business decisions around, you know, specifically what do we want to do and which buoys do we want to pursue or not. And completely independent from us, you know, other people will make those decisions. Um, so we're really in that phase of you know, developing that internally to be prepared when 2024 comes around you know, to, to address the piece that, that we think is best for us. Sort of a small data point. So clearly we are part of a JV right now. If that JV had 100% of the market, which it doesn't, but if that JV had 100% of the market, that means that the maximum we could have is 50%. As you move into a more competitive phase, and you can use the technology and leverage the technology that you developed over decades, clearly the potential is that you can go higher than 50, yeah. which you can't do currently. Yeah, and just one thing I would add about Ultra is, we've said it, we do sonobuies in more than one place. We have a lot of, we have a lot of capability in this area. And, and one of the intents of, of the way we've developed the strategy, we want to leverage all of that, okay, and bring it to bear with either new designs or, or the technology we bring. Um, so I think we're really well positioned. Uh, I think we're positioned strongly. Um, and again, it's just a matter of us making those decisions around specifically what do we want to do. And, um, yeah. um, Richard, if I, and if I can sort of bring that up a level, you know, what it feels like to us is we're in a good place in Santa Boys. We've got really good visibility out through 
2023 with this IDIQ. There are obviously ongoing development contracts available. We are doing our own development. And we actually don't see the Sonar Boy market as a risk for us beyond 2024. We actually see it as an opportunity for us Absolutely. beyond 2024. Absolutely. Okay, because you... Just the biggest opportunities. I mean, so when we went through the strategic uh, process, uh, the strategic planning process um, in 19, we brought in lots of, um, of course, we got grassroots information from all the businesses. We brought in some external um, consultants to just help us think about what the opportunities could be. When you look at our top 10 opportunities over the next five to 10 years, um, the top 10 opportunities map into um, probably 80 plus percent of what we want to do, okay? So it's, it's that sort of 80-20 thing. If we can get the, those top 10 right, um, we're going to be very successful. So I mean, clearly Sonobuies is a big part of that. Um, we, we are making some strategic investments in the kinds of things we pull behind ships, you know, towed systems. We think we're really good at that. We're particularly good at that outside the US. We don't do a lot of that inside the US. Um, so we think that can be a big space for us. Um, so those are probably the two I would highlight. Torpedo defense is, is, is related to that. It's another area that will be really important to us going forward. And we have some really strong offerings. Now the third, yeah, the aftermarket piece. Um, you know, we tend to be very focused when opportunities come up. So we want to pr provide the best technology. You know, so it's the thinking tends to be when we're, when we're doing the development and we're pursuing something, what's the product going to be? What's the technology going to be? Um, how are we going to meet the spec and, and be differentiated from the competition? It's just a mind shift thing. We need to, when we're going through those uh, game planning exercises and getting, pursuing something, to make sure we're doing all the right things that we're prepared to exploit those, those long-term um, support contracts and opportunities. So... I think that's really low-hanging fruit for us, and we just got to get more focused on it. And again, sort of the the issue there, Richard, is uh, firstly we weren't very good at it in the past, and it's you know it's an economic opportunity for us on some of the existing stuff we do. The second piece of that is increasingly the systems and the sensor systems that Tom and the Maritime Division are installing. It's not so much about the hardware anymore, it's about the software. So understanding the evolution of the software that drive those systems does require you to think somewhat differently about your business model. Yep. So software upgrades, systems upgrades, all that sort of good stuff. And again, that's a mindset that is slightly different from the mindset that Tom described us as having um, um, right now, i.e. we just sell really fantastic stuff and it works forever. Um, so I'd say that those are the two main main things that are driving it. It's opportunity driven and what we do today. And also because the market is changing, we have to get cleverer about thinking about well, how. One other element of that is also customer intimacy. You know, as you stay connected to those things, as you understand how they want to do the upgrades or what becomes important to them over time, um, staying tuned into that, understanding what the customer wants is important. So it's another element of that. It's Nick Cunningham, Agency Partners. Uh, U.S. Navy is um, seeing some pressure in some of its shipbuilding programs, and uh, there's conversations about, I think, cutting out five uh, DGG-51s, uh, maybe one or two Virginias, um, early retiring the eight cruisers again, if uh, Congress lets them, um, and um, perhaps accepting a, a fleet size that's 200 and something, not 335 or whatever it's going to be. Yep. going to be. Does any of that impinge on you or do you benefit from where some of that those dollars get rerouted to, to, to the RD yep. T &E? yep. So there's probably a lot of um, threads to that. Um, we, uh, we tend to supply not the big systems into these into these platforms, particularly in the US we tend to supply you know, sub elements. So if, instead of supplying an entire whole mounted sonar, we tend to supply just the transducers. And those things aren't necessarily, you know, directly connected all the time to the, to the new builds. Of course, the new build need those, but there's always a constant churn of having those transducers upgraded and um, serviced, et cetera. So um, we're, the way the US procures things, we're not typically the system supplier. So it's probably not quite as important to us as it might be to the primes 
for example. Um, I don't know if you had any other thoughts. Oh, and, I, and I would say uh, you're absolutely right, Nick, but they're talking about going from 200 and something ships to 290 ships or something like that. So it's a quality problem for us. Frankly, if they ever got above 300, it would be happy days for everybody. Um, so I, I think we're not directly impacted that by this at the moment. We clearly are conscious that, uh, particularly as as the US defense cycle matures, you get into repurposing. We think probably we're net beneficiaries of, re of repurposing because of the things that we do. We don't make bullets and hardware and things like that. What we're doing is making them more and more sophisticated sensor systems with time to, trying to detect threats out there that are being fitted on existing vessels, let alone future vessels. The other thing I would say is, you know, in a lot of these areas, we're underrepresented in our technology. So, I mean, we're not a big player already. It's not like we have the whole market. And so if, if the market shrinks, that, that's material to us. I mean, we're in some cases a pretty small player in the U.S. So even if we gain, even if the whole market comes down some because there's less ships, we still have opportunity to gain space and grow. I've just said so that think for budgeting that. purposes, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> a completely um, unrelated question. Sure. Um, but you used to have a good business selling um, trackside DC power to, to metro systems and light rail and so on. I can't believe you asked this. <laughs> I cannot believe you asked this. <laughs> is, there, is there not still an opportunity there? Because you, you, you have strong technology in, in DC. To we have DC. strong technology. It doesn't fit really the uh, strategic focus we have today. Um, so what I'd say about, and, and it's not just that business, but if you look across this portfolio as any portfolio, um, you know, not everything fits exactly you know, the core, right? So we do have some good bits that are outside the core. We'll look at those, evaluate those. If we're good owners, if they're value creative, we'll tend to keep those. Um, if, if that's not the case, um, you know, we'll, we'll explore what the options are. Um, that's one that, you know, we're, we're evaluating, but it's certainly not, you know, it's sort of in the wheelhouse of what we're trying to do. But we do have good tech. It's competitive. I and it tends to be pretty competitive in the, the yeah. I would get, and of course, it comes down to we may have great tech. If you can't make money out of it, well, sort of, we're probably not the right owner. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly something you probably don't want to invest that much more in. So I, I think what Tom is highlighting, you know, go back to that original slide that I put up around what's the strategy of Ultra. It's got to tick a good, good bunch of the boxes on that for us to want to focus on it because we do need to invest in our technology to keep it current and get beyond uh, and into some of the leapfrog stuff that uh, Richard was talking about. We can't invest in everything we've got. Um, so I suspect that, you know, you won't see us building a massive rail business from our trackside power transmission stuff. Thank you. Mike's going to come up and talk about um, our intelligence and comms division and the, strate the strategy uh, for growth that he's pursuing. Mike, over to you. Hello again. Um, so I'm going to be talking about intelligence communications and our, our strategy moving forward. Um, this is not actually my strategy. Um, my team put the strategy together. Um, they worked very hard over the last 12 months, collating all of the evidence, pull the strategy together, did a really good job. I actually think it's a great strategy. Um, really excited to be here talking to you about it. Um, so I might run on a little bit, but if you see Simon go like that, he's looking worried already. If you're going like that, it's, it's because my time is up. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the name. Uh, intelligence and communication. So why did we pick that name as our new strategic business unit name? Um, it's to reflect our strategy. So the comms element is our pedigree in communications technologies that we've developed over the years. And the intelligence bit is really a nod towards the future paradigm of military systems, which is all about adding intelligence into those solutions. So things like big data analytics, visualization, artificial intelligence, all of those things to make more sense of data and information is where the future's going. So intelligence is a major factor, major element of our future strategy. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we're a secure, multi-domain, command and control, communications, intelligence solutions provider, delivering information advantage. Now, Rich mentioned information advantage earlier. What does it mean? Well, for us, what, it is, what it's all about is providing a military advantage over our adversaries. So it's about, um, it's about being, getting, enabling information to, be, to make 
clear, our understanding of what's going on in the environment, and to make decisions. So ena information enabling. It's about uh, information resilience. So that's the protection, um, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and information. Um, it's about denial as well. It's about denying our adversaries access to information. And lastly, it's about enabling. It's about, um, it's about the or effect. It's about delivering either kinetic or non-kinetic effects. So that's what we mean about information advantage. And in future warfare, that's where the, the advantage is going to be. It's going to be less about hardware and more about how you use information to deliver um, your effect. So that's what we do. Um, so we're a world leading uh, supplier of tactical radios and, airborne, and also airborne data links with some really uh, clever advanced waveforms. Um, we're evolving our position through the application of new technology. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning is a major growth area for us and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. We're also a proven command and control and situational awareness uh, solutions provider. And again, we're evolving those capabilities through the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So you'll hear that a lot today. Um, we're a trusted supplier of uh, crypto and key management solutions, um, but also we utilize those not just as standalone products and solutions, but we use those to provide cyber hardening to our electronic systems that we, we provide. And lastly, um, we provide high integrity, small size, weight, and power, uh, application-specific RF sensors and flight instrumentation capabilities, and also EW test systems. So the very top level, that's, that's what we provide as a, um, an SBU. Um, we're multi-domain, so you can see at the bottom left-hand corner, um, we provide solutions into air, land, and sea. Today, predominantly in the land and air, we only provide 5% of our solutions into the maritime space. So Tom and I are going to get together and see if we can solve that and do more in the maritime space. That's a big area of opportunity for us. By end user, um, we 80%, nearly 80% of our solutions are to the North American market, US market. So great exposure to the um, growth in the US military. And then thirdly, you can see on the right hand side how the the four offerings that we have, which is specialist RF, command and control intelligence, communications, and cyber, are distributed by revenue. So a pretty broad distribution. Okay, so um, what are the, st the strategic themes that we are going to be focusing on as we execute our strategy? Um, the first thing is to develop and invest in our core capabilities. Um, Core capabilities focused on our home markets, where the, the requirement is generally well-defined um, and it's low risk. And then, once we've developed those, we can then look to exploit them in the NATO market. So I was talk earlier about the five, five, five eyes. We, we provide solutions to five eyes. But in the communications arena, it can be a bit broader than that. Why? Because NATO nations want to be interoperable with the US and the UK. And so having developed solutions in the UK or in the US, we can exploit them throughout NATO. Where do we fit in the, in the marketplace? So we're a, we're a tier three product solutions provider. That's where most of our uh, revenue comes from. And it's against application specific problems. We don't design and then try and look for markets. It's always market led. Occasionally, we'll go up to tier two. So that's um, you know, system, subsystem solutions, but only where we've got domain knowledge. So we understand what we're doing. And typically also, that will be where we have a you know, significant value in a solution. We're not going to operate in that space and just be a, a thin prime, pulling together other people's solutions. We need to understand it. We need to add value. So occasionally, we'll do that. The next point is actually um, a challenge. So we're going to be moving from a division of autonomous businesses, site-based businesses, to a strategic business unit, which has market-focused areas, 
or as we heard earlier, operating business units. Um, in addition to that, we need to put in place efficient and effective systems and processes to enable that to happen. That's, that's a real challenge for us. Now, fortunately, over the last sort of um, six months or so, I've been adding to my senior management team. Um, uh, Andrew Pierre's here today, he's my CTO. Really pleased to have him on board, because um, after 31 years, I figured I don't really know as much about technology as he does, so <laughs> that's really good. Um, but I've also been strengthening in the, in the HR area, so we've got an HR business partner on the SMT, um, and also a new strategy and business development lead. So I've got a really, really strong team and I've confidence in to deliver what we, what we need to do. And, it's, it, and there's a lot of work to do. So this year is really about transition. Uh, Simon said earlier that uh, by 2021, this, this new structure is going to be embedded. So over the next year, we've got to embed this structure and deliver our numbers this year. Technology is moving ahead at real pace, um, not least in, in my sort of market focused areas. Uh, so it's very important that we increase our investment in innovation and disruptive technologies. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, we want to be differentiating ourselves from our competitors and driving that long term growth. And that's one of no pressure for Andrew, but that's one of his focus areas to figure out where we're we going to invest and get that return on investment. Um, and then lastly, the real focus there, we've, we've got some really good long-term customers. Uh, but what they tell us is that we're very tactical and they don't always know what we do. Um, so we've got to articulate ourselves in a better way. We've got to develop those relationships to be more strategic, have strategic conversations, share our technology roadmaps, and share our, our strategies so they're aligned. So it's a win-win out output. Um, and Laurie, who joined my team just before Christmas, asked me in her area, how do we get more strategic relationships to drive the business forward? So they're the five um, strategic themes that, um, that, that underpin everything that we're going to be doing over the next 10 years. OK, so the next sort of eight or so slides, a lot of detail on there. They're in your pack. I'm not going to go through everything. I'm going to give you a feel for what we're doing in each area. Going to start with comms. So within the comms uh, operating business unit, uh, we have sort of three main uh, capabilities. So tactical radios. You heard about the Orion radio earlier. Um, in our position on that with the um, the, the U.S. Army uh, order that we won not so long ago. So that's a land-based, uh, multi-mode uh, tactical radio. Supplementing that, we have a communications pod capability. Uh, it's an airborne pod can fix the, to you know, fix wind air, or UAVs. And essentially, it's a network in the sky. So it's connect the air and ground. And lastly, we have specialist data link capabilities, which are really application-specific problems, really specialized things that we've been doing for a while, and we're really good at it. So they're the three things that we do. And it's all about assuring connect connectivity in challenging environments. More and more, the, the electromagnetic spectrums that exist in the, in the battlefield are harsh. And I talked earlier about um, AI, ML, artificial intelligence. We're adding that to our radio capability. Why? To give our radios intelligence so that they are cognitive of their environment um, in, in order to optimize their performance, optimize the setup so you can deploy quick, but also operate, op, op, um, get better at the performance. So that's a real uh, sort of focus area for us. Um, as I say, we've got marketing position in the upper tier tactical radios, ground, ground radios, but we see significant um, additional opportunities. Why? Because having secured a position in the US DOD in the Army, we're now looking to exploit that in adjacency, so the Marine Corps, the Navy, um, and there are other areas where we, can, we see plenty of opportunity to exploit our tactical radio capability. <clears throat> so next, um, operating business unit, command and control intelligence. Um, so what do we do there? It's all about multi-domain, real-time information to, to the user. Um, from a command and control perspective, we've been providing ADSI, which is our air defense system integrator, to the US DOD analyze for over 20 years. 
So a real good position in command and control. Um, what we're now looking to do is broaden our offering uh, into what we call multi-domain intelligent systems. And there's sort of two aspects to that. One is to apply um, artificial intelligence to um, the geospatial uh, visualization. What do I mean by that? So if you've got uh, a, 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 a display that shows the geographical locations where you are, where your adversaries are, what you want to do is, is to figure out what, what do you need to do? What's the next action that you need to, to take? Well, it turns out there's a lot of information and operators get overloaded. So if you apply artificial intelligence to that in a way that looks at anomalies, looks at trends, you can take that burden away from the operator, the user. He can be more efficient and get the job done quick. So it's like that's a real differentiator. And we, we have started over the last sort of year or so focusing on that. The second area of opportunity for us, and again, we're already in development for this, is um, a product um, we call Rain. And that is about uh, taking, is bridging national intelligence to the tactical edge. So, I mean, it, it, that's not an easy problem because you've got cross-domain security issues to worry about um, and the connectivity. Um, so that, that's going to be a major focus for us to enhance our overall command and control and intelligence uh, capability. So really excited about where we're going on that. Um, so proven command and control solutions, positioned to benefit from um, AI ML, um, from a market size perspective, it's about 200 million. So it's a real, from our perspective, we're, we're operating in a niche, niche place. And we see about 3 4% CAGR over the period. Um, and on the RAIN product I talked about, it's getting to the, the, the strategic, to tactical connectivity. Um, we're well positioned with the US uh, Air Force um, to develop that capability. So they're, they're our launch customer. Uh, key thing for us is to be first to market in that, that capability. <clears throat> Third area is cyber, um, where we've been a trusted supplier of crypto key management systems for over 60 years. Been doing this a long time. And in this space, trust matters. People like GCHQ, NSA, they won't work with everybody. They work with people they can trust. Um, so we provide type one high grade crypto to for sovereign needs in the UK and the US. But also we will again try and exploit that in NATO because they want to interoperate with us. So that's our market too. And occasionally we'll do work for other countries where they're looking for sovereign uh, capability themselves. The other area that we, so moving away from the sort of top secret high-end crypto. We also have solutions in, uh, in the middle tier, uh, FIPS accredited solutions that uh, we've been selling to the US DOD, in particular Navy for some years. We see a great opportunity to sell, uh, sell that capability to basically secure cloud-based operations. So you know, everybody uses a cloud application nowadays. Well, they use it in the military too. But one of the issues they have is at the tactical edge, your encryption has to be a little bit more secure. So we have solutions that can be in the tactical edge and connect to the cloud. So that's going to be a major sort of focus for us. Um, we do a few classified programs, which I'm not going to talk about for obvious reasons. So um, in this market, we are a leader in this space. Um, and as people become, our users become more worried about the computational power of quantum computing, uh, that represents a risk for them because traditional cryptos, um, given time, you can crack the, the encryption. Um, so you have to move to what we call quantum safe or quantum res resistant algorithms. And we have solutions for that. So we're working both in the US and the UK to provide those sort of quantum safe um, solutions that, uh, that they're looking for. Um, the market is about half, about half a billion. Uh, we see the CAGR being at five, five to six percent moving forward. For us, it's a niche space, um, but it's been, as I say, we've been doing this for 
well over 60 years and we're, we're a market leader in it. Final area um, is specialist RF. Um, so in this space, we do a range of things which are all around, all about, um, well, a niche sort of multi-spectral RF products and systems. So, you know, what does that mean? So in the so three areas to it, tactical RF products, where that's about providing solutions to support um, autonomous systems. So UAVs, missiles, and the like. There's a big drive towards autonomy. And we have solutions um, that can fit into that space. Second area is missile flight instrumentation. So we don't do communication systems for missiles per se, but what we do do is test kits. So, so when the US do test fires of, of the Trident missile, it's our test kit that goes on there to allow them to have telemetry and information coming back to make sure it's doing what they think it should be doing. That's, that's what we do. Um, we've been doing that for many years and have a strong position in that space. And then finally, uh, EW test systems. Um, this is all about um, radar, EW simulation, and target generator. Um, you can't quite see the scale, but the, the racks of equipment on there are, are pretty big racks, really sophisticated uh, technologies that we provide for testing our ships and our, and our, our Navy systems. So in this space, again, it's very niche. Um, you see the CAGR here looks a bit funny, it's only 1% to 2%. Why is it only 1% to 2%? It really represents a cycle in this space. So we do a lot of work um, in, the, uh, in the missile environment, providing a lot of, to most, most of the uh, US missile programs. And what we've, what's happening at the moment is a lot of old programs are coming down and then and they're developing new programs. So they, this, represent, this really just represents the dip in that cycle. Um, but we fully expect, because we have long-term relationships, we fully expect to, um, to have a position on those ongoing programs. So, for example, Trident is coming to its end now, but Trident 2 will come up and we've got good relationships for, for that opportunity. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out on this, a bit of a, a strange acronym, but PSSC, uh, Precision Strike Sensor Core, what is that? Um, well, actually, that's an exciting opportunity for us. That's basically putting communications into smaller munitions so that those, those, those munitions can identify targets and you can course correct to make sure that you're hitting the right target. That's an incredibly difficult environment to operate comms in and getting two-way two comms. We have solutions that actually are based on mobile comms technology uh, to solve that problem. We're working with Boeing um, in the early stages of developing that capability. That shows great uh, opportunity for us as we move forward. Okay, so this is my final slide. Um, so they, these are the actions, the focus areas that we're gonna be um, positioning ourselves over the next sort of five to 10 years. These are the things that are gonna drive the execution of strategy. So I'm gonna go through them because I think they're important. So from a communications OBU market focus, we wanna capture a greater share of the DOD's upper tier radios, tactical radios. So I talked about the army position, we're in a good position. We wanna now focus on what can we do for the Navy? What can we do for the Marine Corps and the special forces? We also want to take our solutions and move down a tier. Um, so the, ta the, the upper tier comms is all about um, communications with the headquarters. We want to go down to the mid tier, utilize our solutions there. Much bigger market, um, but we think we have the right technology to try and enter that space as well. I didn't talk about REAP, Establish REAP as a leading communications pod. So REAP is our name for our communications pod. Um, we want that to be one of the leading communications pods in the infantry. Uh, we've got a good position with the, um, the Air National Guard in the, in the US. We need to execute well on that and then see if we can then take that to other, other um, customers. And then finally, uh, we want to secure a position in the next generation fighter aircraft integrated comms. We've got a lot of specialized data link capability, a lot of pedigree there, and we're working with the likes of BAE on where we would fit into that space in the future. Command and Control and Intelligence, um, talked about ADSI, our Air Defense System Integrator, Command and Control System. It's well deployed. We want to extend that 
At the moment, we're, we're mainly in the airborne market in, in the sense that we provide situational awareness for the airborne picture. But there's also a naval picture and there's also a ground picture. So there's a lot more adjacencies we can take that capability into. And especially if we can then add that artificial intelligence machine learning capability to allow our users to operate much, much more effectively. And then Rain, I've talked about, we want to be first to market in that national to tactical connectivity. In the cyberspace, we have um, some, some really good products that um, were already designed, qualified, and we're in operation in the UK. We see opportunities to exploit that capability throughout NATO for that interoperability. We want to secure a position in the DOD's drive for cloud-based operations with our tactical edge encryption capability. Um, I think we, we, we've got some good things going on with the Army. Um, really excited about that. And then also, we really talked about it, but there is a drive to have bigger pipes of information, uh, high data rate uh, pipes. And we've, we're starting to develop a high data rate crypto solution. And we're not talking about 10 megabytes or one gig. We're talking 400 gig pipes encrypted, <coughs> which, is, which is huge. Um, we want to be first to market to, to have certified products in that space. Finally, um, Specialist RF, we want to be the number one supplier in, um, in missile telemetry, exploit our position that we're currently in. We're going to invest in refreshing some of our uh, core products. Uh, so we have radio altimeters, we have um, micro uh, IFF systems, so identify friend or foe, flight termination systems. We need to upgrade some of those capabilities to be digital and autonomous. I've talked about the uh, position sensor strike core, so I won't talk about that again because I can't say it. Um, and then finally, we want to expand our EW test systems capability that we have here in the UK and been, been very successful in, in, in exploiting that around the world, but not in the US. And that's going to be a, 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 a focus area. Probably the most exciting thing about our strategy and will drive real value is the thing that I've put underneath, which is combine our core capabilities to offer our customers unique value propositions. What do I mean by that? Well, individually, we offer some great solutions and real value to our customers. But if we can combine our communications and our command and control and our cyber and our specialist RF capabilities together to offer unique things that don't exist today, just think where we could go. And so that, that's really exciting. And I think the, um, you know, Simon's vision of how we work together with the One Ultra the strategic business unit approach is, going to, is a real enabler for this. Um, so I'm really excited about that. That's my final slide. I think I did all right. I'm making up for my poor performance. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Good. And as Simon said earlier, the purpose of today was really to talk about maritime, which you've heard about from Tom. Thank you. And... Uh, intelligence and comms from Mike, so thank you for that as well. Uh, I'll just do a couple of minutes on this section, which is our other um, critical detection and control businesses. Um, as I said earlier, the reason why we're not going to go into huge depth here is because, number one, we haven't really finished defining those growth strategies for these businesses, and number two, um, it's, it's less obvious that we can get the same level of parenting advantage on these businesses as we can on the ones that Tom and Mike have just been through. However, they are fantastic businesses in their own right, and they're a very important part of the group. And I just wanted to remind you, first of all, where they sit. Um, so you can see um, these three businesses, precision control systems, energy, and forensic technology, are about 30% of group revenue in 2018. They're about a third of the profit. And you can see the breakout below as to how that profit and revenue split was in 2018. That will become useful as we work through the year. I think we've already mentioned that we'll be sort of rearranging the deck chairs a little bit. So... That will just give you a bit of a high-level overview of what, what sort of data you can expect to see later on. Um, but I just wanted to remind you quickly as to why they're such great businesses. So looking at precision uh, control systems, it is uh, a business with phenomenal pedigree across civil aerospace, military aerospace, and warfighter protection, soldier survival. Uh, it's got awesome, quite often 
single source positions on platforms where it bids. Uh, these are typically uh, electronic control systems or they're pneumatic control systems. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just tremendous, right? And, uh, you know, bluntly, uh, we don't have many competitors in what we do. So, yes, you have a bit of an early stage competition, but once you've secured a, a long term position, a position on a platform, it's yours, unless you monumentally screw up, which we don't intend to do. Um, so, brilliant business, PCS. Uh, very exciting. Uh, great growth potential. Fundamentally, a really good end market, civil aerospace being the, the predominant driver, good place to be. Energy, um, we've got some great technology, uh, an installed base based around instrumentation and control on over 500 nuclear power installations worldwide. That will drive spares and repairs revenue for decades. And overlaid onto that, of course, you will have critical life extensions where we will participate. And of course, we still remain at the forefront of designing new instrumentation and control systems for the next generation of nuclear power. Uh, and there is always going to be a place for nuclear power in some way, shape or form. We have got a really interesting option value on small modular reactors. So there's a, there's a program out there in the US, it's called New Scale. Um, it's the only game in town in the US on small modular reactors. We're a shareholder and we're the only INC provider on that program currently. So that's got great potential. And then finally, forensic technology, um, brilliant business. Uh, it's all about identification of um, the origins of ballistics. Where's Serge? There you are, yeah. Phenomenal business. Um, so if, you, if someone gets shot, if you can capture the bullet or the cartridge, you can do some 3D analysis, some 3D imaging. The way in which you capture that image and build a search algorithm around it, around it is quite a powerful tool in understanding where it came from, has the gun been used before, it's predictive algorithm, so over time the signature left on a bullet as it go through, goes through the barrel will change as the gun gets older. These are predictive algorithms that can work out what that signature is going to look like a few years from now, so that if the gun gets used again, it can be identified again. I mean, it's really, really clever stuff, very exciting. Um, so we, we've got some great potential in that business as well. Um, like I say, arguably less obvious where we're going to get that parenting advantage. But having said that, these are great businesses and we are going to work through them very hard as we go through 2020 to determine what the individual growth strategies are. So that's all I wanted to say on these um, other businesses. However, um, Mike, where are you? Come back. We'll, we'll open the floor to Q&A now in the same way as we did for poor Tom earlier um, on everything he said plus the little bit I said. <clears throat> so on um, intelligence comms or the little bit we did on, on the other critical detection and control businesses. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Hall, Willis Towers Watson. So two questions, if I may. Uh, firstly, um, the, the idea of understanding end user requirements. So you alluded to the fact that the levels of capability you're generating, um, you know, you're, you're providing into, into a rehearsed position, but of course, the greater the innovation and the investment. Uh, my question is, um, is your engagement with UK, US, for example, end users, are, are you finding you're needing to lead the end user more than the end user needing to lead you? Um, a, a question that yeah. perhaps exists going forward. Is it private public or public private leadership that, yeah, was, um, that, well, that generates the, mm. the perfect equation, let's say, because knowing the art of the possible is a, yeah. is a, big, is a big question. And, yeah, it, and, it's yeah. an iterative process. Yeah. I mean, we want to be seen as thought leaders in what the art of the possible is. Um, cost users sometimes don't know what technology is available, so they don't know there's a solution. So it's an element of you have to work with them to tease out what's, the, what's, what's really their problem. Where could we add value? And I think working with the user is very, very important. Um, obviously, we have, generally speaking, we work through primes as, uh, when we get you know, under contract. But, but working with the end user where you understand the real problem is so, so important. Um, but it's an iterative thing. Um, you know, we're very good at solving problems. We need to be very, a bit better at understanding what our customers' problems are in order that we can solve them. So that's that strategic discussion, technology roadmap discussion that um, we need to be having regularly, not once a year, every five years. It's, re it's a regular conversation about what are your problems, what we can do to help solve those problems. And are you finding the the end users' doors are open far enough for making that happen. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, there's lots of examples where we've been very successful in doing that. And generally speaking, the doors are open. Um, I think there are other areas where we need to improve. 
uh, hence the greater focus on, on, on strategic relationships, not just with customers, like the primes, for example, but also with the users. Um, thank you. My second question is uh, IP, uh, just by way of, um, you're obviously designing, owning some very interesting designs here that are put into as components into other systems. Are you, are you generally content with uh, the risk relating to IP or, or have you got um, a lot of work to do in, in that? Uh, so we, we've got a huge amount of work to do and we are doing a huge amount of work on IP identification and retention. Um, I, where you are managed as a, an aggregation of relatively small businesses, you end up with an aggregation of relatively small approaches to IT, IP identification, retention. Um, I think we can take a slightly more grown-up attitude to it now. Uh, and Louise and her team are doing a huge amount of work on exactly that. So identifying where the, the flowers in the attic are um, and how we either use them and maximise our own utilisation at the expense of everybody else or monetise them where that's the right thing to do. I, w I would say I don't think it's a major risk for us because a lot of the intellectual property that we have is soft and very difficult to repeat. Um, so I think the businesses have actually done a good job of protecting themselves at the right level at the right time. The exercise that, uh, that Richard and uh, Louise are referring to is about aggregating that all together and making sure we're getting the best on the IP that we have um, rather than being too concerned about any exposure we have. Uh, Nick Cunningham, Agency Partners, so with a, another nerdy question about um, US budget reprogramming. Um, that we're, we're seeing some really big dollars go into hypersonics, and it's just about to take off, and maybe then counter hypersonics as well. Yeah. And we've also seen the Army pretty much abandon the future increments of wind T. Mm -hmm. Those both look like they ought to be opportunities for you. Is that right? And it, what's a, it, does it have a, a meaningful scale? And um, is it in the time scale that, that will matter for investors? Okay, so, so on the hypersonic side of things, yes, that's an opportunity for us. And indeed, we are working with um, some of the customers, some of our long-term customers in that space. Um, so, I, so there's a lot of recapitalization of missiles, hypersonics is part of that. Um, and so at the early, we are at the early stages of how can we take the existing capabilities and evolve them to, to what's required uh, for hypersonics, which is quite different, um, or <coughs> certainly evolving. Um, so I think we are well positioned for that. Um, I think that's going to take a number of years because it, you, missile programs just take a long time. Um, so I don't expect that to be a major thing in the next five years. I think it'll be beyond that. Um, the Winti program, it, yeah, it's rebranded now. It's not called Win Winti. Um, so the NetMod um, program, uh, Network Modern Modernization, that's where we've got our IDIQ for the upper tier comms. Um, the mid-tier that I talked about is, is, was another, it was called Winti Win Increment 2, which was the mobile comms bit. Uh, that all st <coughs> stuck in mud, um, didn't go anywhere. We have solutions that can fix some of those things. So on our IDIQ contract, we uh, managed to get a position so our smaller radio that has mesh capability, commas on the move capability, is on the pricing list. So the Army have the ability to buy a solution for that space. Obviously, we've got to work with them to try and uh, convince them that's the right thing to do. Uh, and that's one of the major focus areas to, to, to grow in that space. So I see that as a, as a big opportunity for us. Um, but they've had their fingers burnt in that space. And I think they're very wary about where they go next. And, you know, we're not the only solution. So a lot of hard work to do, but we have an opportunity. Uh, if that answers your so, question. So the Army's backfilling with something which is a more conventional, ground-based technology rather than the SATCOM on the move and, and so well, on. Yeah, so at the moment, they're not really doing a lot in the increment two because that, that got stuck, so the comms on a move. Um, so um, SATCOM has a, spa a place, but I think the biggest issue is how do you get the mobility um, through, which requires mainly mesh solutions rather than point to point. And then also the interoperability with soldier handhelds. So, so in the mid, so, you know, big handfuls, top tier, it's, you know, thousand radios, mid tier, tens of thousands, lower tier, hundreds of thousands of radios. And that's the handhelds. In the mid tier, it's about connecting to the upper 
which we've got a position on. So interoperability between those two is going to be key. And then interoperability between the mid and the lower tier is all about how do you connect to handhelds. And we've already integrated the ability to interoperate um, with the lower tier. And clearly we can, in, we can in, interoper or interoperable with the upper tier. So we have, from a technical perspective, I think a good solution, but there's a way to go. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Christophe Mina from Kepler Chevrolet. Just one question on the um, NATO. Uh, I mean, you want to sell your product to the NATO partners or the other nations. Historically, that's not something you've done. Um, so, what what are you changing in the organization to do it? I mean, uh, are you changing the business development? Are you pricing it in a way that uh, those NATO nations will buy your solution? I mean, okay. basically, what are the range of options you have? Yeah, yeah. So you're right. We haven't been um, a major provider of communication solutions, command and control solutions into NATO. Probably more in command and control because the ADSI solution that I talked about, uh, we do. Um, that's, that, that is in, in NATO and allies. So we have been relatively successful there. But in the common space, you're right, we ha and crypto, we really haven't, uh, hasn't been our major focus. Um, what, what we find, it, so it is going to be about business development and those strategic conversations that we need to have. Um, I th so we're going to have to strengthen that in order to you know, have the channels. We now have solutions that are interoperable with NATO. Um, one of the things is, uh, in, in certain areas, is non-ITAR controlled solutions are important. So a lot of NATO nations, whilst they want to be interoperable with the US, they don't want to have the incumbency of ITAR restrictions. There's a whole bunch of uh, impacts to that. And so we do have solutions in the UK that we can exploit and give the benefits um, you know, to the NATO nations. So I think there's a couple of things there. We're better positioned from a, a solutions perspective. And I think we've got plans to get a lot better you know, strategic conversations and the business development. Okay, all done. Good, thanks, Rich. I think I'm Joss. You coming up now? So Simon asked me just to give a few initial impressions. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this business a month in. Um, I'm going to spend the next couple of months on the road working out where the value is and how it's created. Uh, but I have spent the last month talking to a lot of people, including 150 people that we've had over the last couple of days. So I feel I've done enough due diligence now to understand what makes the business tick, at least at a high level. So I'm going to talk about some of those impressions. And I rather selflessly spent until one o'clock in the morning in the bar with the top 50. So I heard what it's really like in the business. Um, it's fair to say that of the five multinationals that I've worked for, this is the most exciting one that I've been in. Uh, that's partly actually a numbers thing. Um, the growth of this business has the potential to be very good. The markets are behind us. And of course, it's much more fun working for a business with a tailwind. And I think that we have the capabilities and the people to grow above those markets. On top of that, the returns on capital, at least at an operating level, incremental level, have the potential to be very good. So I think that we can grow this business and generate strong returns on capital for our shareholders. Now, Nick already said to me in the break, ah, but the returns aren't that good. It is true that we've spent a lot of money on acquisitions, and I accept that at that level, our returns are not that good. But I don't want to penalize the businesses on that basis, because actually their ability to generate good returns on every dollar we invest into them is very high. They're quite low capital businesses. And if we can grow them, there's a good chance that we can grow returns on capital for our shareholders. But it's not just on the numbers side, it's also qualitative. I feel that we've got an exec team that is strong, that is aligned, and that is up to something. I feel that this is a business that knows what it wants to do and that we can drive forwards over the next two or three years. And it's also the technology. The one really common theme, even from the guys in the bar, is that the technology in Ultra is really good. We can do more, of course. In particular, we can invest a bit more, and driving operational efficiency will help us do that. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But also, we can get closer to our customers. 
And that helps us know where we can make our investments, which bets we can make and get the best returns for our investors. As you all know, culture can destroy any strategy. But in Ultra, we're now a year into driving cultural change. And in particular, over the last two days, we gave it a really good, strong push. And I feel that the organization, at least the top 150, really understand the case for change. They understand it well enough that they can go into their businesses and propagate the case for change and get other people on board with the case for change. And I feel that there's a general understanding that we need to move with some pace and speed and deliver change into this organization. The wheel is definitely starting to turn, and I think we've got a good chance of turning it faster and faster. But to do that, of course, we need great people. We're starting to invest in people, and I think it's fair to say that Steve has driven the HR work streams of transformation the fastest of anybody, so thank you, Steve. But we need to invest into our people, because this is largely a people business. And we are investing into leadership skills. We're investing into lean skills. We're trying to create a high feedback culture. And we're investing into engineering. And we need all of that to really help this business accelerate over the next period of its history. On strategy, I'm not going to claim credit for any of the strategy. It was all done before I'm here. But it's super helpful for me because it helps me tell where can we focus our limited resources, which businesses have the potential to really grow above the market, and which ones we should really be managing for value. And I think it's great that we've got a differentiated portfolio with some stars and some businesses that will manage a bit differently. In terms of operations, it's fair to say there is an absolute mountain of opportunity on the operational side. I mean, just to give you a few anecdotes, I think we've got 20 different ERP systems, over 30 different IT infrastructures, 19 separate charts of accounts. And to make it a bit more real for you and what that means, I went to the shared service center uh, in Wimborne in Dorset in the UK. They're running nine different purchase to pay processes. That means we have nine different ways of paying our suppliers. That does not create value for our customers, and it's not automated. So there is opportunity to drive efficiency everywhere across this business, whether it be improving or reducing the rework rate at the ends of the lines, to stopping doing manual eliminations in our accounts, to stopping double keying data. Everywhere I look, there is money that we can save. And with some of that, we can invest into R&D, and some of it will look to return to our shareholders. In terms of performance opposite our customers, we've now started to measure our OTIF, and we've started to measure our net promoter scores. And both of them, I've seen the KPIs and the data on now. It's really important that we deliver on time to our customers and that they are delighted with us. Why is that important? It's important because I don't want to spend the first hour of a customer meeting with them complaining about our performance. We want them talking to us about what can you do on the technology? How can we work with you? What opportunities have we got in, in front of us? So we need to get the basics right. And there's a lot we can do on improving our OTIF. We're now starting to measure it. And hopefully, it will start improving. Turning to capital discipline, I have a separate slide on this. So starting on the left-hand side, I've mentioned this already. This is largely a people business. It is nothing like the businesses I'm used to in either Castrol, where we had expensive blend plants, or GKM, where we had very, very expensive machinery on the shop floors. This is largely a business with human capital. And I think that as we grow it, it will not require enormous capital input. Nonetheless, focus is important. Focus is important to doing things fast, and focus is important in directing management attention. So it is great that a lot of work has been done on the strategy in working out what are our core capabilities, what do we really need to invest in to make this business win. Just turning to the yellow blocks in the middle of this, because I believe the underlying returns on capital are so strong, my primary aim is to grow this business. I think it's a fantastic business. I think it has the opportunity for growth. However, I don't want to rule out using all the tools for growth. I think there is a possibility that we may want to bolt on additional capabilities, particularly in the areas that are our strategic focus. 
but we will do that in a disciplined way. We will only acquire things if it helps our strategic direction and bolsters our core businesses. We will not be buying more businesses that are on the fringes of our core strategy. We will seek to maintain our existing dividend and increase it over time, looking to pay out roughly half of our operating free cash flow through the cycle. I think we have opportunity to invest in organic growth, but there may become a time where we don't have any further investment ideas. If that happens, then we will return cash to shareholders either through a special dividend or, or a buyback. But I'm not envisaging that happening at the moment because I think we have plenty of things that can generate strong returns internally. In terms of leverage, uh, actually we've got a pretty uh, low leverage position at the moment. Uh, and we have a good long-term order book and a stable business. So I think we can take on a bit more debt over time, but we're not going to go crazy. We're going to keep our uh, net debt to EBITDA at around one and a half to two and a half times. That's on the kind of most conservative measure with uh, pensions treated as a debt-like item. I would say on pensions, we're paying it down pretty fast. Uh, the pension debt should be eliminated in the medium term, uh, and that will also free up at some additional cash flow to invest in the rest of the business. Overall, it's a fantastic business. I'm absolutely delighted to be on board, and I think we can do some stuff here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. <coughs> so final stretch. Um, this is where those of you that are really itching to use your Excel spreadsheets might want to think about getting them out. Um, we do think it's worth translating everything that we have showed you in quite a lot of detail around technology and capability and set some expectations about what you, particularly the investors, can expect or should expect from Ultra going forward. So in terms of growth, um, Rich has uh, flagged for you what we think the growth rates are over the next five to 10 years in our major market. So three to five, four to six percent around that. Um, clearly, it won't be that in each year. You know how all this works. But those are good sort of market growth trends and relatively consistent with what other people in the R spaces say. Um, for 2020, we'll talk to you more about this in March. But the sorts of things you should expect are us converting our already strong order book and a robust underlying market means that sort of market growth rates, you know, they feel like the sorts of things you should be thinking about. In the medium term, we have pretty good visibility on this business. You heard again from Rich about the fact we're on lots and lots of programs. They have longevity. We have good visibility on USDOD spend. We understand the trickle down that happens. And even when they go into a more constrained spend environment, the repurposing often creates opportunities for us, not risks. So good visibility in the medium term, and you should expect us to outperform those underlying core markets, in part because of stuff we've already done, programs we're already on, but also in part because of some of the aspiration, particularly in the maritime and the intelligence and communication space that Tom and Mike so eloquently shared with you. There's real opportunity here. So I do think that you should see us outgrowing our markets in the medium term. And in the longer term, look, we get most of our businesses are exposed to a cyclical defense industry, but the threat environment and our ability to satisfy current and future customer needs to address those threats are likely to outweigh any affordability concerns. So again, you should see us continue to outperform our underlying core um, uh, core markets, in part not just because we think they're pretty good anyway, but you've heard about all the opportunity that we haven't even tapped into yet. So those, I think, are what you should be thinking about for us in terms of growth in the short, medium and long term. In terms of res resilience and how that translates when you get lumps and bumps in the market, look, we're pretty resilient. We've got good visibility into 2020. Um, in the medium term, actually, almost independent of the marketplace, 
Uh, as you heard, Tom commit to his budget market growth, uh, budget share gain in ahead, ahead of market growth. So I know that Joss has written that down. But actually, we're a pretty small player in the markets in which we play. And we're pretty agile, too, with lots and lots of uh, capable technologies. So I think we have an ability and will have an ability to grow sort of independent of the market through share gain, even if the market is relatively flat. Uh, so I'm pretty comfortable. That we've got good resilience in the medium term. And in the long term, we're never going to diversify away the defense cycle but with longevity of contracts, with agility, with us being relatively small players in relatively big markets, but a small player with great ambition means that we should be pretty resilient and predictable in the long term too. Uh, Self-help and delivery. In 2020, you'll definitely see us continue to invest in the business, both in terms of internal research and development, in terms of the infrastructure that we need to create a more joined up organization, and also strategy, um, uh, strategy reorganization. You've seen the reorganization that we intend to launch in 2021. Some of the costs of putting that in place will be taken in 2020. What does that all mean? Well, around the sort of operating profit margin-y sort of level, you know, top line growth, pretty consistent margins. I wouldn't expect you to see any margin improvement in 2020. Um, in terms of percentage of margin as, as a percentage of revenue. Uh, but I wouldn't expect you to see any material decline either. So pretty consistent margins whilst we're going through this change program. In the medium term, this is not a short fix. This is not a one-year crystallization of a bunch of cost initiatives. This is about changing the culture of an organization to make it aspirational and hugely value creative for all of its stakeholders. That will require us to continue to invest in underlying infrastructure, in standard applications, in tools, and in people. So for the medium term, the next couple of years, I would not expect you to see a huge amount of margin when represented as a percentage of profit return on sales. I wouldn't expect to see a massive improvement in that over the next couple of years. In the longer term, when we've done all the hard fixy stuff, when the culture is fixed, when the organization's running well, I do believe that our business provides us with some margin improvement potential. So if we're not starting to deliver that in two or three years time, you should be giving us a bit of a kicking. Returns, as Joss has said, uh, notwithstanding some investments that we made, which were perhaps not as successful as anticipated when we, when we made them, this is a capital light business. So as Joss has, has quite rightly described, growing this business doesn't require us to build huge factories with very expensive machines in. It's about people capital. It's about software development. It's about machine intelligence. Um, so you should see relatively stable returns in 2020, uh, whilst we're investing in the business, we don't think we have to put a huge amount of capital back into it. Similarly, in the medium term, you know, we absolutely will see EBITDA, ROIC, sort of in excess of 18, 19%. And again, you'll start to see that growing two to three years out. We're not great believers, though, in pruning to increase your return on invested capital. What we'd like to do is to deploy an appropriate amount of capital and generate a decent return over and above the cost of that capital. But certainly, you should see uh, EBITDA ROICs in the medium to long term for this business well in excess of 20%. And then finally, cash flow and capital allocation. Joss has really touched on this. I won't, I won't go into it. Whilst we're in investment phase, you'll see 60 to 75% cash conversion in 2020, somewhere in that range. That will step up uh, in 2021 and beyond. And then we'll be at around 90% cash conversion through cycle. And the issue, we, the only issue we've got between 100% and the 90% we're talking about is effectively funding the pension deficit. Um, which we will look at is that an is that a cash efficient is it a cash efficient way of deploying capital um, and deploying cash and, and that'll be one of the things Joss looks at over the next couple of years, but ultimately this is a hundred percent profit to cash business as you would expect for something that's asset light. 
So the standing back, I think this is pretty exciting. I think this ticks a huge number of investment boxes that I've rarely seen before in an organization. And so I think you should expect and demand from Ultra, from Ultra an exciting future. Okay, so that's about it for today. Uh, I know it's been a pretty intensive, preachy sort of day for, for you guys. The purpose of it, though, just to remind ourselves, was to introduce you to the new team. And it is a new team at Ultra. Um, it's a new team with a great toy box and train set to play with, but some pretty capable people that have done this stuff before. Hopefully, our strategy is much clearer to you. Uh, hopefully, it's clear where we intend to play, not power transmission on London Underground. Doesn't feel quite like it's the center of what we do. But what we do is actually, there is a great common theme that prior management built into all of our businesses and even some of the businesses that look surprising when they purchased them. At the end of the day, there is some core themes here which allow us to be good owners of the businesses and to drive real value uh, in those five SBUs we've described. Markets are good for us at the moment. Clearly, that's all to do with me. Um, <laughs> no, you need a little luck sometimes. So, yes, we are at a good point, particularly in the defense cycle spending, and that isn't going away any anytime soon. So we have good tailwinds, we have good momentum, and we are delivering growth. We are seeing really good deployment of our strong technology base. Our technologies are what customers need to address future concerns. I mean, some of the risks that Nick was talking about that the US government is highlighting fits right into our space. It's all around more information for more rapid response. That's the stuff we're really good at. Um, resilience, this is a pretty robust business, particularly in terms of cash. It's got good visibility. So um, I think uh, uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't anticipate seeing massive swings in profitability or huge surprises. Um, in terms of performance, you've heard from Joss, he's salivating. The number of opportunities to drive underlying improvement in the operational performance of our businesses. Our challenge is not finding them, it's working out which ones to work on next. Um, and then lastly, returns very much more focused on <coughs> sustainable value creation and driving those returns on capital in a sustainable way. And lastly, I hope you've got from the team, if there's one thing that unites us all is the excitement uh, and actually the privilege of being able to lead an organization like Ultra at this stage in the company's development. I'd like to say that all of this work was put together by these seven or eight people. Actually, it wasn't. Really, Mike alluded to it. This is all the outcome of the whole of Ultra, sitting down to work out where it can add exceptional value going forward, what it needs to change, how it needs to change, and the pace at which it needs to change. And coming off the back of a two-day management conference where we saw real buy-in to making this happen over time, that's what gives me and I think the rest of the team great confidence that actually this is real and this will happen. That's it for me. Too much talky, too much preachy. Five minutes early. Um, throwing it open now for some sort of more formal Q&A. Thank you, Richard Page. Um, just, uh, we've obviously, there's a clear emphasis here on the cultural change that needs to happen within Ultra. We, we can see in the upper management, there's a lot of change. Already. <laughs> if I was sitting in the business, what would I have seen thus far in terms of the progress made? And then obviously aligned to that, um, incentivization through the organisation, what changes are being made and what's in place? I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Steve to pick up uh, the question about sort of alignment of incentives and all that sort of stuff and the work he and his team have done. But uh, uh, somebody might want to get him a microphone because otherwise he'll be doing shouty stuff. Um, in terms of what the organisation is seeing, it is seeing quite a bolstering of functional capability. You heard Mike talk about appointing a CTO, Chief Technology Officer Andrew, um, 
uh, uh, Fred is is uh, is Tom's CTO. Uh, in some cases, these are people that have been in the businesses that have been promoted into these roles to start to coordinate and drive strategic technology development, um, and they're seeing a lot more coordination of that strategy and investment. Both of them also have chief marketing officers. Again, uh, back to some of the questions that were earlier, to drive a much more focused strategic level marketing uh, initiative with our customers, both in relation to engagement and also in terms of marketing and active selling. Um, they've seen uh, promotion and change to the finance functions. So they've all got CFOs. They've all got HR business partners. All of this stuff is new. So the organization sees uh, quite a lot of change going on at all levels. Um, what the organization hasn't seen yet but what happens this year and next year is it starts to lose some of the infrastructure that's lower down in the organization. So when you're running uh, 19 P&L reporting units, 30-odd businesses, you have 30-odd management teams with 30-odd finance directors and 30-odd marketing directors and 30-odd et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What this organization does is not only create capability and expertise at the right level, it also ultimately reduces and takes away some of that surplus cost, which was great when you were running a small business, but actually you don't need when you're just focusing on operational delivery. So I think the organization has seen quite a bit of change up here, hasn't felt much change yet in the day-to-day -day stuff that they do. But if you would stand here in 2021, I'm pretty sure that they'll say, yeah, they've seen a lot of change and are creating more of a pyramid management structure while still keeping decision making where it needs to be. Steve, what have we done on rewards and incentivization and all that sort of good stuff? Yeah, so um, a few things, I think, um, short-term, structurally, and also kind of long-term. So I think the first thing, and one of the best decisions I made, is I brought a global um, reward director in <laughs> uh, fairly early on, recognising the amount of work that we needed to do in this space. So from a short-term perspective, we made some um, some quick changes, actually, towards the end of 2018. So uh, we brought in um, uh, a focus around individual performance. So historically, our bonus plans have been focused very much on profit um, and cash. And we wanted to make sure that we brought in an individual component piece to that and actually give some categories and some hard, smart objectives to uh, individuals within the organization to focus not just on short-term objectives, but also some longer-term objectives. So uh, that was one of the first kind of key changes we made. Second key change was um, around actually some of the measures within that bonus program. Um, so getting them to focus on cash throughout the year rather than the kind of one or two key points in the year to send the message that that's really important. So I think um, from a bonus perspective, some fairly early changes. Um, structurally, we've looked at making sure we've got a really clear pay philosophy so we know that you know, all our different component parts to our, our, our pay and our reward and our compensation all line up to you know, what is it we're trying to do with it. We want to you know, make sure it attracts and retains the right people, it recognises the right people, it drives the right short-term versus long-term um, focus. And I think the final piece is more on the kind of longer term stuff. So looking at um, uh, our, our longer term incentive plans, making sure that we um, drive that through the organization, making sure that the measures in there are, are the right measures um, and that individuals are making some kind of sort of longer term choices and driving longer term value um, in the way in which we align our reward programs from a, from a long term incentive perspective. So I think a little bit around changing the way in which we're looking at performance, some of the short term measures. Um, and then uh, we're looking at recognition programs right now around how do we embed some of the values in the organization through making sure that we recognize that. So uh, taking a bit more of a kind of holistic structural piece to it as well. We didn't have a global gro uh, grading structure, uh, which made it quite hard for us as well to manage our populations. So to know what reward lines up to where in the organization. So we're also looking at that as well. And we're planning to roll that out in the next, uh, next couple of weeks, actually. And, you know, only having one long-term incentive plan, not 31. <laughs> and only having, um, and having the organization focused on the same measures and making sure that the people in the line companies and the SBUs get remunerated, not just for what they're doing in their little individual business or their SBU, but they're also getting remunerated for working effectively across businesses and across SBU. So all of these things have actually been built into our incentive and reward packages to align the organization about behind this cultural change. And I have to say, Steve and his team did a fantastic job in getting that done in a year. So a um, lot of work there. And if there's what else, I think, 
It's, he's not going to be able to walk out the door. Well, actually, please, and he's got double doors here, so it should be fine. Steve has done a huge amount around beginning to put in place all the things that you need to drive one organisational culture. And actually, we're way ahead of where I thought we'd be um, uh, at the beginning of 2020. Um, I think you, Steve's about a year ahead of where I thought he'd be in his transformation program. So he's done a great job. All right, guys. Well, it, it doesn't look like any. It looks like we've either been so comprehensive or we've bored you to death. Thanks very much for your attention, and we'll see a number of you in March. Thanks. <laughs>